Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. Just went solo camping recently, and my close-ish neighbors who were RV camping were the absolute worst. They were drunk off their asses day or night, which is fine, but that meant they were extremely loud while thinking no one could hear them. Multiple things were said about me and their other neighbors, including her black tent, means she's a part of BLM. I think she's a Ann Mutt. I'm biracial. Women like her are going to be the end of us. She's obviously doing drugs. She's obviously a lesbian then, a bunch of xenophobic shit about the other campers. Half the time they sat there literally just watching me set up, process wood, etc. These dudes then proceeded to drive their truck by my campsite a few times and once actually came to a full stop and just sat there staring. One of the couples that were part of their camp also got into a bad fight during the day. I have camped a good amount in my life, and they topped the worst people I've been next to. It was honestly bizarre. I ended up staying for two days, because I was watching for eagles, but the trip was definitely a bummer. Outside of them, most neighbors and trips have been wonderful. Finally, a chance for me to tell my story. About ten years ago, my family and I were up in the White Mountains of Arizona to cut down our Christmas tree. My dad was driving our truck with my grandfather in the front seat and my mom and sister in the back seat. I was in the bed of the truck along with our family's German short-haired pointer. We were driving along a forest road and all of a sudden my dog starts barking and growling. So I look to see what it is, thinking it is maybe a bear or mountain lion. What I saw was a tall, dark figure walking parallel to the road, just about 60 to 70 yards away. I yelled at my dad to stop the truck. When I told him I think I see Bigfoot, he just laughed and continued to drive. When I looked back to get another look at it, the figure had changed directions and was walking away from the road. The last thing I saw was the thing's head disappearing down a hill. To this day, I still do not have an explanation for what I saw. And every time the situation comes up, my dad always makes me tell everyone my story just so he could laugh. Myself, along with four other guys, decided to park on Anthony Road and walk out to the middle of a field to have some beer. We lived in a small town with not much to do. Keep in mind, however, that we hadn't yet started drinking, and even if we had, I don't think it would have caused a group hallucination. The reason we had guns was due to an incident prior to this, where my female cousin and her friends, who were all about five years younger than us, came back to my aunt's house one night very scared. They said that they were driving down Anthony Red when a guy was lying in the middle of the road. They had to stop the car since it's a narrow road, so they couldn't turn around. They put the car in reverse to back up, and just then, the guy in the road jumped up and started chasing the car. People came out of the cornfields trying to open the car doors and stop the car. They took off in drive, came back to the house, and told us what happened. Hence the presence of guns the night of our encounter. The night we had our encounter was very bright. There was a full moon or near full, shining down on some pretty thick fog that was about chin high, so visibility was quite high. We drove up and down the road once, just to make sure no cops were parked anywhere, and then we spotted the field we wanted to go into. It was really cool looking, with the fog lying heavy on the ground and the moon bouncing off of it, giving a really cool glow effect. We parked two cars and began to venture into the field at the area where tractors would enter. We walked about 20 or 30 yards in and stopped to listen for cars and to make sure no one else was around. One of us noticed something large and dark along the wood line to our right, about 150 yards out into the field. We all stopped talking and watched it for a few minutes, trying to determine what it was, a tree stump, large rock, bush, etc., 
After a few minutes, we decided it was just a big bush and stopped paying attention to it, walking further into the field. After going into the field a little more, one of us noticed the object wasn't there where we had seen it before. We began to scan the area to see where it went, and then we noticed something running from right to left across the field in front of us. It looked to be about three feet above the fog line, if not four feet. That would make it bigger than any dog. The way it ran reminded me of a cheetah or greyhound dog reaching out with long forelimbs to grab the ground and then hurling its hind haunches under itself to spring forward again. Its silhouette looked like a wild boar or hyena with the stereotypical large hump on its upper back. It ran really, really fast to the center of the field and then turned directly towards us. I've never seen anything able to change direction as fast as this thing did, especially considering how fast it was traveling. At first, we thought it had stopped running, but then after a second, we were able to tell it was now coming straight at us. We were all asking and commenting with each other, trying to reason what it was, dog, cougar, bear, etc. As it continued its charge, we raised our guns at it. I had a shotgun, and two of the other guys had pistols. When we raised our guns, it began to zigzag. I remember thinking that it knew what guns were. I remember seeing, or one of us said, that thing knows we are pointing guns at it. I think that's when we got creeped out enough to run for the cars. My buddy, the Facebook guy, said he didn't shoot because he couldn't identify the target. I personally, and I'm not ashamed to say, think it's because we all got scared, realizing it wasn't any known animal. It was moving so fast that I thought if I missed, or if my first shot didn't stop it, I wouldn't get a second shot. Shotguns are only effective within certain distances, and I didn't want it getting too close to me. As we were running away, my friend at the time fell into a groundhog hole, so I had to run back and help him up so we could get to the cars. Given how fast it was running, I don't think it was really trying to catch us, or it would have, when we got to the cars and took off, I recall looking out the side window, and this thing was chasing the cars. Once we got over the little bridge on Anthony onto Manning Road, we were able to get up more speed. I don't think it ever came out of the field or across the bridge, though. It was as if it just wanted to chase us off. It never stood up on two legs, and I didn't notice any eye shine. I think it may have been too far away when it started its charge to see the eyes. I can tell you that it was bigger than any dog and much, much faster. It was able to zigzag really fast, like a rabbit. It was very jerky in its side, the side movement, almost twitchy, I'd say. I got the feeling that it was so quick and agile that I might not be able to get a bead on it to get good hits on it with a shotgun. When we were pulling away in the car is probably when I got the best look at it. It had odd body mechanics as it ran. It reminded me of a cheetah, and I could tell the forelimbs were longer than the hind limbs. I couldn't see a tail or the shape of the ears, however. Relevant background info. I've always loved to dance. When I was nine, we moved into a bungalow. My new bedroom had a big, wide window that took up roughly half of the wall, and for some reason I didn't have any curtains. But weird in hindsight, but it suited me just fine because at night this window would serve as the perfect mirror for me to watch myself dance, and I would just pretend I was in my own studio. The window faced into the backyard, which was loosely fenced, shitty old fence that provided little privacy, but single mom who worked a lot and barely getting by as it is a replacing fence not major priority one summer i had just got back from visiting family in europe i was 12 my mom and brother had also been on the trip but had returned home about a month earlier i go in my room and notice that my mom has hung curtains it struck me as odd even then because my mom was not the type to spontaneously do nice things for me, but I just assumed she had missed me and wanted to make my room cozier for when I got back something. I forgot about it until about a week later when I bring up the curtains. Before my mom can say anything, my younger brother goes, You haven't told her. Told me, 
What? Well, apparently, while I was away, my mom and brother were just hanging out in the living room, which is beside the front door. One night, when suddenly my dog started barking like there was someone at the door. It was past midnight, so my mom was understandably freaked out, especially being there alone with a ten-year-old. Anyway, there is no knock at the door, but my dog is still losing it, so they turn out the lights to try and see if there's something outside. They see two people walking around the front yard with flashlights, turning the corner into the backyard. So my mom opens the door just wide enough to let the dog out to investigate. Someone starts yelling to get the damn dog under control, and they realize it's two police officers. My mom gets the dog under control and asks them what's going on. They tell her that they are responding to a call reporting a man seen sitting in a tree on the southwest corner of our backyard, staring into a window. You can probably guess which window. Anyway, I didn't sleep in my room for a month after that and couldn't think about it without feeling on the verge of a panic attack for years. Since then, I am always very, very vocal about people having curtains. You may not suspect it, but you never know who could be watching you from the dark. So because of work, I had to move out to Kern County in Southern California. Aside from hot weather patterns and dryness here and there, it's generally pretty nice. The house I ended up selecting was out in the pines since the housing costs were cheaper up here. However, I would have been better off spending more on something closer to town. I'm convinced that there is something living up here that is somewhat intelligent, about two weeks after moving in, I started having trouble sleeping. I would toss and turn and have horrible nightmares that I would only vaguely remember when I woke up. One night it was particularly bad. I woke up shaking and sweating like a pig, so I decided to wander into the living room and sit up a few minutes. I was still half asleep and a little delirious, but it seemed to me that the room was darker than usual. So I sat down and turned on my TV. About that time, I heard something heavy bolt across my porch, like a man running at full speed. I looked out the window and realized that I could see the moon when before I could not. Whatever it was had been standing there right in front of the window, blocking the moonlight. Over the next few days, things were relatively stable, except for a few oddities. Things would move from where I had placed them, but not drastically. On one occasion, I found the remains of a dead coyote in my yard though I'm not entirely positive that it's related. Overall, I wasn't too worried about whatever was causing this, because obviously it hadn't done anything to hurt me. So why would I have to worry? Except the events that happened last night have spurred me to post this story and seek some possible solution to this little issue. I arrived home late last night after spending time performing maintenance on the company server. When I pulled up into the yard, it was deathly quiet, no crickets or anything. I had this feeling like I was being watched. While I can't explain the exact feeling I had with 100% accuracy, I can say it felt like what you would expect to be facing something that wanted to harm you, like a wild animal or something. The problem was I didn't hear or see anything. It was a real physiological sensation that was not quick to leave. I forced myself to sleep that night, but the dreams came back causing me to toss and turn. There was no way that I was going to walk back into the living room last night, either in the event that whatever it was I saw before is back, watching from outside. I do not look forward to going home tonight. Part 2. I'm writing this update from an internet cafe as I've discovered that I have lost power to my house. It's purely coincidental, of course and in no way linked to my current situation. I called up the power company and was assured that someone would be up to take a look at it in the morning. After leaving work today, I took a short drive through the mountains to steady my nerves. It worked, but only in part. The forested valleys and rivers are beautiful. Even the deserts hold their own. I was starting to feel alive again, but... I couldn't shake the subtle feeling of dread knowing that I would have to spend another night. 
Well, anyways, I started home and arrived at the two-lane road, which ascends into the forested area above where my residence is. There are a few sporadic houses on the way up, including my closest neighbor's house, where I happened to notice a police car and ambulance park. The subtle dread and apprehension started to make itself more apparent as I passed by. I arrived home, and the wind had picked up substantially. It was rustling through the trees and leaves, making it difficult to discern any movement from anything non-elemental. I walked up toward my porch and smacked this pine cone, comes flinging into the side of my house. I nearly pass out from the surprise, but then, hey, it's windy. So I walk in, flip my switch, and nothing. No power. Great, I think. There is no way in hell that I'm going to spend the night here without power. I remember reading this article once on the theory of genetic memory and its possible link with phobias. It's the only thing I can think of that would explain the feeling that came next. I heard something moving quickly, something that definitely could not be elemental. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and my body became stiff to the point where it was difficult to raise my arms. I could sense something behind me outside my door and in my yard somewhere. I didn't want to turn around at all. I just wanted to be as far away from that moment as possible. I just stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was most likely only one or two seconds listening. Leaves rustling, twigs and branches blowing against each other. I forced myself to turn around expecting to see some hideous creature standing there smiling at me. It would have been more comforting than just turning around and seeing nothing, which is exactly what I saw. It was like a cruel joke. I made a dash back to my car, jumped in, slammed the door and locked it. Against my better judgment, I decided to drive by my neighbor's house to make sure everything was all right. After having seen the ambulance and police there earlier, at least I would be near other people. My neighbor's wife met me at the door and looked distraught. After some conversation, she explained that she walked into the house and discovered her husband laying on the ground, knocked out. After the paramedics arrived and he came to, he explained what he remembered. He came home and found that the back door of his house was off its hinges, like someone forced their way in with a crowbar or something. After investigating, he walked in and felt this buzzing in his head and wave of nausea. After that, he remembered getting hit in the head with something and then nothing. Of course, considering current events, this unsettled me greatly. So now I find myself sitting in this internet cafe, pondering my next move. I had never heard of Dogman, but I saw one in town run past the floodgates, down by the river on my way to the recently opened park that was closed due to floodwaters. It didn't look like a scary werewolf but more like a weird dog running on three legs. Its tail was curled up. I went on a quest to find out what this was because I have never hallucinated and I knew what I had seen. The ones most people are reporting are not exactly like what I saw. However, had it stopped to look at me, I'm sure I would have found him quite a bit more frightening. Hello? I am hoping you can shed some light on an incident I had a few years ago. I was 25 at the time and was driving to my friend C.W.'s house. It was quiet at 11.30 p.m. as I drove south on an old country road off of Redacted, Highway Near, Reacted, in North Georgia. Very few people pass this way because it leads to nothing but a small group of houses. I turned on the radio, but nothing came on. I figured it was a blown fuse, but then I started to hear weird scratching sounds coming through the speakers. It sounded like a distant voice, but I couldn't understand what it was saying. Suddenly, something flew in front of the car and hit the windshield with enough size and force that it totally mangled the grill and hood. I immediately stopped the car. I heard what sounded like wings flapping on the roof, but then something rolled down the back window onto the trunk then eventually onto the road. I thought I killed whatever it was. A woman in a truck had pulled up from behind and said she saw the thing hit the road. She said that its eyes were glaring bright red. As we looked more closely at this thing, it resembled a man with large bat-like wings. 
The woman walked back to her truck, pulled a shotgun from the back, and pointed it at this bat-like creature. It was starting to move, and we backed off. It slowly stood up on two large raptor, like claws turned and stared directly at us with those terrible bright red eyes. The woman pumped the shotgun. It slowly levitated off the ground with wings spread until it was about ten feet up. Then instantly, it let out a deafening screech as it just disappeared with a loud swoosh. The woman, who I found out later was C.I.D.'s aunt, and I just looked at each other. This thing had the body of a well-built man. It had no feathers but charcoal gray skin like that of a bat with some hair on the shoulders and around the eyes and legs. When it spread its wings, it had a span of 12 feet or more. I estimate it was about 8 feet tall. It had no head, however, just the eyes embedded on the shoulders that had brows. I didn't notice a mouth or nose. There is no way I was going to report this, and Cubby's aunt totally agreed. We both drove off to Cubby's house. I was so shaken up that I stayed the night. The next morning I went outside to inspect the car. There was a huge crack in the windshield, and the grill was mangled beyond repair. The hood also had a deep 25-inch dent. I started to walk back to the house when I noticed something lying in the grass beside the garage. It was C.W.'s golden retriever lying dead from massive lacerations up and down its back. I just knew that thing did it. That was three years ago, and I constantly dream of this creature. I was told by a friend that I had encountered a mothman. It looked more like a Batman, to be honest. I decided to look up a few of the sightings by others and saw your name and blog. Many of the images on Google were very similar to what I saw. I wrote to someone else about a year ago, but they never got back to me. My cousin went on a camping trip with his wife on a rather quiet day for camping. According to my cousin, the ranger informed them that they were the only ones camping at that site for the night. As evening approached, my cousin noticed something across the lake. At first, he thought it might be a bear standing upright, so he grabbed his binoculars. However, it resembled a bear only partially. It was standing on its hind legs. He was certain it wasn't a bear because it had a face resembling that of a 70-year-old man, and its fur was longer than that of a typical bear. He considered the possibility that it could be someone in a suit, but it disappeared swiftly. Whatever it was, it spooked him profoundly, and he wanted to leave the park immediately. His wife, on the other hand, dismissed his concerns as mere imagination and insisted on bringing a shotgun, just in case. That night progressed uneventfully until my cousin was awakened by footsteps. His wife was still asleep, so he didn't want to disturb her. He tried to remain as still and quiet as possible. A figure approached their tent. My cousin positioned himself with his head near the tent's corner. The figure leaned down and gently pressed its hand around the corner of the tent, essentially placing its hands near my cousin's head. He couldn't recall how long this encounter lasted, but eventually the figure departed. My cousin mentioned that it had a peculiar mechanical scent, reminiscent of someone working on a car, although there were no audible signs of a vehicle. The next morning, everything at the campsite remained untouched. There were no issues whatsoever. My cousin didn't find any footprints or evidence suggesting that someone had been there. He later researched the area and discovered that their camping site was supposedly a hot spot for Bigfoot sightings and similar phenomena. He firmly believes that he encountered some form of Sasquatch. I personally have reservations about fully believing his account. I've often thought it might have been someone playing a prank on him. I have several other stories, but I didn't want to make this post overly lengthy or overwhelming. At the time, I lived in northwest Michigan. My hybrid son was taken in mid-April of 2012. They used the word claimed. I carried him for about two months. I knew he was a boy, and I named him Drax, named after Max, his human father, and the draconian reptoids I am involved with. During my pregnancy, my ex was shut down, and I was taken for several hours. 
When I was coming to, I saw a figure standing at the side of the bed making circles above my stomach. I knew I had just been returned, and I knew they were making one last check on the baby. He was brought to me on October 10, 2012, for feeding and bonding. He would leave claw marks on me while feeding. He didn't mean to hurt me. There was absolutely no feeling to the red and infected. Looking claw marks, and they were basically gone in four hours. There is so much more to this than I could possibly try to write. They have been manipulating my pineal gland. They can use me as a computer loading and downloading information. I feel as if I am ahead of time. I have received many messages from them and continue to. I have many very credible witnesses. They include an attorney, a fireman, or a farmer, and a prison guard. I've been regressed five times, and some are recorded. The psychologist who regressed me would be willing to speak. I need help. I have reached out to many people. The only time I feel okay is when I am sharing what is happening to me. Some of the things that are happening are difficult to share because they make others very uncomfortable. So I am left holding all this inside. I have been doing illustrations, writing down everything, and keeping track of dates the best I can. This all started in 1960, one when I was 12. It was a sighting daylight with several witnesses, including two police officers. I am still in contact with the chief of police from back then. Unfortunately, he is 93 and in bad health, along with good and bad memory days. He was at the station and said he fielded calls for over 20 minutes. One of the calls was from a fellow officer at the scene, and another was a city councilwoman. I was discouraged from talking about this in hopes that I would forget. It was the worst thing my parents could have done. I never talked about it for 50 years. It was only when I met a ufologist and college professor on September 1, 2011, that I opened up. I told him of the sighting. That's all I thought it was for 50 years. But I lived with PTSD and panic attacks. I haven't had a pop smear in 20 years and still am unable to watch someone get a shot or IV. He was a smart man and knew there was more to it than that, so he found the regression therapist. At the end of my first regression, I felt myself immobilized and going up into the ship. One of the very first messages they gave me in 2011 was, All memories are packed and taken with us in each new life. When the load becomes too heavy or we no longer have the energy to carry it, we travel as light, knowledge, and energy. This took place in the summer of 2004, around July, in the Bristol Bay County. I am a commercial fisherman in Alaska and have been doing so since 1970. I'm an avid outdoorsman hunter and someone who just loves to get out there. Every year after fishing, I try to take a trip upriver with a friend or two to wind down and enjoy ourselves before we go home. This year, while I was on this trip into Alaska's interior, our main mission was to take pictures of bears and the surrounding wildlife to promote a new bear viewing and sports fishing business. While on our five-day trip, we spotted more than 40 bears. I took hundreds of pictures of these bears and their tracks, one of which was so big it put chills up my spine and gave me and my companions a very uneasy sense of insecurity. What set this track apart from the others was its enormous size and human-like shape. In one of the pictures that I took of this track, I placed my foot next to it on the ground. Keep in mind I'm wearing a size 13 boot. Whatever made this track was so heavy, heavier than the biggest bear, that it had pushed the gravel so far into the earth that it made us truly speculate what we were looking at. Other pictures that we took of the bear tracks were nowhere close to that indentation that this track had left. One of the most intriguing things about this track was that there were no visible claw marks. With all the other bear tracks, both of us felt extremely uneasy of our surroundings and had the feeling that we were being watched. For the rest of the day, we didn't have much to talk about and that night felt uncomfortable at camp. We never heard or smelled anything out of the ordinary. To this day, I'm not really sure what we saw, and I'm not making any claims other than the words I have put forth. 
I've only heard of one other story from an old native man that lived by himself, a true hermit. He spoke of a tall creature that walked on two legs and watched him for thirty minutes from across the river, which his cabin overlooked approximately two hundred feet away. When first sighted, he was motionless, staring straight at him. Then this creature, which he named Hairy Man, turned and briskly walked away. Here's my dogman story. Let me know what you think. Well, let's see. I'll start by saying that I wasn't expecting anything unusual to happen. My partner, Steve, and I attended his friend's annual CB get together at Grant County Park in Critton, Kentucky. It's about 45 minutes away from our home. It was the 1st of October, and the weather was pleasant in the 70s. The park spans 54 acres, offering plenty of space to explore, including a playground area, a baseball diamond with lights, and a basketball court. Additionally, the picnic area features five shelter houses, a horse ring with a barn and stadium, and two multi-purpose buildings. I love nature, so the ample space appealed to me, especially when dealing with people. I brought a few joints with me to help with pain and keep me calm. The get-together lasted from noon until whenever, and many people showed up. I brought cupcakes with us, but to my chagrin, I later learned that Steve's friend was diabetic and sugar was a no-go. So not the best first impression, but oh well, screw it. After grabbing something to eat, I decided to take a walk around since Steve knew most of the people there. Our picnic spot was up front, so I decided to explore the other side while smoking and taking in the surroundings. During my walk, I took pictures here and there with my phone, as I enjoy photography. I couldn't help but notice that I was being drawn to the woods behind the baseball diamond, and goosebumps covered my arms instantly. I felt a strong urge to go to that spot, even though I didn't sense any malevolence. It was just incredibly eerie to me that the pull was so strong. I knew something was there. I took out my phone and stopped walking, standing close to a tree that had caught my eye. I took a few pictures there and then started heading back to where everyone was, even though I still felt the strong urge to go to the area that had drawn me. Later that night, when we were back at home, I looked at the pictures I had taken and applied some grayscale effects to them because they looked awesome that way. I noticed that in one of the grayscale pictures of the tree, there was a distinct figure resembling a spirit. You could see it quite clearly. I showed it to Steve, and he thought it was cool, but then asked about something by the bush. That's when I saw it, a pair of eyes staring at me from the area I had been drawn to. I got goosebumps immediately upon seeing it. I initially thought I had captured a hellhound in my photo. But when I finally showed my pictures to my friend Teresa, who was into UFOs, Bigfoot, and the paranormal, I knew she'd be interested. When I told her where I took the pictures, she informed me it wasn't a hellhound, but a dogman. As a believer with an open mind who has seen and experienced many things, I thought it was incredibly cool. Teresa, on the other hand, didn't share my enthusiasm and warned me that I was lucky it didn't follow me home. Nevertheless, I didn't feel threatened by it or anything of the sort. Ready is a term that has shown up in many stories about close encounters of the third kind. I am very much on my guard for when this word shows up because I have had an encounter in which the word was spoken to me by a reptilian. In August 1959, my parents and I were traveling to Colorado Springs on a vacation. This was before my 11th birthday on August 19. For some unknown reason, Dad decided that we would stop and visit Mount Capulin, an extinct volcano in the northeast corner of New Mexico. Mom stayed in the tourist center while Dad and I climbed up the side of the volcano and down into the crater. Then we returned to the center. I had a desperate need to go to the bathroom. As I was walking through the center, I felt myself stop in mid-step. I felt my mind lift out of my body and drop straight through the floor. How deep, I cannot imagine. My drop ended in an arched tunnel deep underground. 
The tunnel was lighted with orange lights. Standing in front of me was a smallish being or entity that I now know to identify as a reptilian. I would estimate its height at somewhere around four feet tall. It was wearing a gray color robe with long sleeves and a hood. The most I could see of its face was intense, oversized dark eyes. In its left hand, number of fingers unclear but definitely a thumb. It held something that we today would describe as an iPad or the light. In its right hand, it held some kind of stylus. It looked straight at me and with mind-to-mind -mind talk said testily, What are you doing here? We're not ready for you yet. Then my mind zoomed back up through the ground and back into my head where I stood in the tourist center. Immediately, I double-timed it to the ladies' room and got relief just in time. Since then, I have lived wondering when the we that this alien or entity represented would be ready for me. I have had other encounters with UFO-related entities like the MIB dressed in a black warrant officer uniform driving a yellow Mini Cooper on a military base near Keflavik, Iceland. He told me, go home, and pointed towards the southwest in North America. Maybe the aliens or entities have visited me, and I don't remember it. Thanks for letting me tell my story. I used to work about 30 miles away from where I live. One night I had been stuck in heavy traffic coming home. I take LASIK, so after a while I really had to go to the bathroom. I kept telling myself that I was almost home and tried to hold it until I got there. By the time I got to my exit, I knew I wasn't going to make it to my house. So I pulled up to an area where Fidelity Investments is located and found an area that was isolated. This area is heavily wooded with walking trails and a lot of game, but it is also in a very populated area. I pull up a little side, drive off one of the main roads. That little drive is about 100 feet long with only room for one car. It went up an elevation and had bushes on the right side facing the main road. On the left side, there was a guardrail and a view of the valley below. The area up there is huge and isolated, with several buildings that are all spaced out. The place is dark at night because there are intermittent street lights up there. At night it's pretty deserted too. A few cars go through that area though because it's a shortcut people use to go from Taylor Mill over to 3L Highway, where there are stores, restaurants, etc. When you're up there, you're above everything around this area. When I stopped, I got out of my car, waited a moment and looked around to make sure there were no other cars. It was winter, so the bushes between where I was and the road below me didn't have many leaves on them. Because of that, you could see right through them. I was up on this little rise, about 20 or 30 feet above the drive, which was four lanes wide. To the left of me was a street light and more woods that went down another hill to the main road. I went to the back of my car and did what I had to do. When I finished, I stood up, and all at once, every hair on my body stood up. I knew I wasn't alone. I scanned the area in front of me and must have heard something behind me because I turned around, and there were three deer standing there, all huddled up together between my car and the guardrail. They weren't looking at me. They were looking across the road. I looked back over there, and that was when I saw a figure standing between the bushes in front of it and the tree line behind it. It was huge. I stand five foot five. Some of those bushes were about six feet tall, but they only came up to about the collarbone area on this thing. Due to the street light to the right of it, about twenty feet away, I was able to get a pretty clean outline of this thing. It had a large dog-shaped head and pointed ears. I couldn't make out at its neck, but I could make out massive shoulders. That's when it growled. It was a deep vibration I could feel in my chest. My body just took over at that point. I have to explain this part of it to you. I worked security for years in California in the music business. As a woman, I have to really work out and train to defend myself. I kickboxed for eight years and worked out every day. I also trained dogs mainly Anatolian Shepherds and German Shepherds. 
Sometimes I have to establish who is the alpha, and to do that, I get them down, hold them in place, grab them by their ear, and growl until they submit. Then the training can start. So when this thing growled at me, it was just pure instinct. I dropped them to a crouching position and growled right back at it. When I did that, it stopped growling and started sniffing the air. Its snout went up and it turned its head slightly as it was sniffing. It then took a few steps forward. I was still crouched down on all fours and moved forward, still growling at the thing. When I did that, it stopped. I stood up and kept staring right at it. I never broke eye contact with it. Then it slowly stepped back into the tree line until I couldn't make it out as clearly as before and started to move to the right of me. The deer were still behind me. They were so close I could have reached out and touched them. I waved my arms and told them to get out of there. When I did that, they went back over the guardrail and took off down the hill. That's when I jumped in my car and got out of there as fast as I could. I felt this thing was trying to circle behind me, and I wasn't going to wait around for that. Do I think I scared it? No, but I do think I confused it for a couple of minutes, and that gave me time to move. I told my husband about what had happened up there, but I didn't tell him exactly what I saw. He would think I was nuts, and to be honest, I thought I was a little crazy myself, until I saw a picture of a dogman. I know there are other things in this world that can't be explained. I've seen them, but this was beyond any of those things. Since this has happened, I can't take that shortcut through that area anymore. My husband took me back over that way once to see the area, and I was begging him to get me out of there the whole time. I thought I was going to throw up. The wildlife up there has almost totally disappeared. I never see anything up on the hills anymore. The street I live on is only about one mile or so down the hill from this place, and lately we have seen coyotes on the streets. Like they have been chased out and pets here have started to go missing. We've also seen a large black figure moving through our backyards down here. The dogs throughout the neighborhood go crazy regularly now, too. People were calling the cops when we saw that large black figure jumping fences. I'm concerned that it has come down the hill after eating everything up there. Sash Lake, visiting from Wiltshire, reported that at 12.20 p.m. I was leaving Drumna Drochit on a coach admiring the view while the coach was driving past the lock. It started to rain and a light fog rolled in. My view vision was partly limited due to the trees alongside the lock, but something caught my eye for approximately five seconds and made me jump out of my skin. I saw a huge black mass hump in the middle of the lock, roughly the size of a double-decker bus. I would say it was around 75, 100 yards away from me. I was confused and in disbelief. I jumped to my feet to get a better look. Trees completely blocked my view for about five, eight seconds. There was a clearing in the trees, and when I looked back to where I saw the black mass on, there was nothing. There. A few years ago, a good friend of ours was in a car severe accident in which the passenger was in critical condition whom I didn't know, and the driver, who was our friend, was also in critical, but worse condition. Within the first 12 hours, our friend, whom I will refer to as Mary from here on out, died at the hospital. I am unsure of the fate of the passengers, as I didn't know them, but I believe they did survive. Originally, the news of her death was brought up to me by another friend, and later confirmed it when I looked it up and saw it on a news web page stating her full first and last name, which I might add is not a common last name at all, but don't feel comfortable disclosing here. Circumstances of the accident and location of the accident. After a couple days of checking for an obituary to get funeral details, I eventually saw it around day two or three, but unfortunately it said the family wished to have a private funeral open only to relatives, 
Death wasn't a new thing to me, as I unfortunately already had a few friends pass by at this point in time, but it was pretty unsettling not being able to say my final goodbyes at a funeral, as is usually the norm. Fast forward about three, four months or so, I'm going about my daily routine and coming up to a four-way stop sign at nearly the same time as another car. The other car pulled up to the stop sign and at the road perpendicular to my right. I remember this so vividly, and we'll never forget it. Knowing a car was there, I probably glanced at my phone for a second to let them go ahead, and some loud screaming caught my ear over the sound of the radio. I blow it off for a second, but it continues in increased frequency. I look over real quick, look forward again, and then it crosses my mind. No way in hell, and I look back over again. And damn if it isn't Mary leaning out her window of that other car, waving her arms all around screaming my name, trying to get my attention. The weirdest chill and feeling came over my body, literally as if I'm seeing a ghost and questioning my sanity on whether I was seeing things. At this point, I yelled out the window to tell her to turn right and pull over on the first street, which was within eyesight. I get out of the car and literally am stuttering, and don't have the first clue of what to say, and she just decides at that point to lean in and give me a hug. She was solid, and I could feel her hugging me, so at that point I was assured that she wasn't a ghost low. I explained to her how I'd grieved over her death, and how I saw her obituary, and everything, and she thought I was half crazy. I wish I could explain the way it feels to see somebody you knew was dead for a few months and then be able to hug them and have a chat in the most unexpected way possible. But I don't even know if there is a word in the English language to describe it. Now, where it gets really interesting is after sharing all the details I knew of her passing and accident, everything matched up minus the death part but I vividly remember seeing the obituary and the news article with her name and all the details of the accident that I explained to her. She actually did get in a terrible accident and was just released from the hospital a couple weeks before I saw her after she spent a couple months in the hospital. The exact road and location I told her were the correct spots too. The first 30 days she was in the hospital. She was in a coma and had a rough recovery and many surgeries following that, so it wasn't minor by any means. Later that day, I tried finding the obituary and news article, but they were nowhere to be found. But where did I get all the info from? This has been weird for a while, but for the longest time I blew it off as someone with the same name in a similar location, but I can't find anything on that either. The likelihood of someone with her exact unusual name is highly unlikely, too. Not sure if this was a glitch or if I shifted timelines. Seasons never change high enough above the snow line. In this land of endless forests and shrouds of drifting mist, I've hunted here on my people's traditional land with my father and with the ghosts of my ancestors. Guided in knowing my path, I call myself a man, but to those whose forest this is, I animal, friend. It was a day when the dark green shadow of the mountain held a bridal veil of pure white clouds. Old Raven was calling to me asking for crumbs from my sandwich. That is the last moment of my life when I was at peace. Many seekers of Skookum come here. They think they will find evidence of Bigfoot while they camp, hide camera traps, and hike a few miles into the ancient forests. I know Skookum, and it takes a lifetime of understanding and growth, not just a four-day hiking holiday in some amateur knowledge. There is a dark side to Bigfoot searches. Not all of those who track him are without knowledge. There is Silent Owl, a fallen medicine healer whose family died a few years ago during the plague that swept through our homes. His ways have changed. He will not use his magic to heal. The skookum in his eyes has grown cruel and broken. So when the hunters came and asked me if I was Joseph Pale, I told them I would not help them find Bigfoot, for it was their intention to shoot the legendary beast and become famous. I told them, Bigfoot is not an animal. 
He is like a man peaceful and considerate unless you are trespassing and planning to hurt his family. I will not help you, and I'd suggest you turn around. I thought that would be the end of it. They could go into the woods with their rifles, and they would find nothing but the ranger waiting to check their hunting permits. I doubted such men could even find an elk, let alone Bigfoot. They had no skookum, judging by their oversized rifles. I will help you, but not for less than double what you offered Little Fox. If he has said no, it now costs double. The chilling and calloused voice of Silent Owl spoke from my shadow where he had walked over from the lodge to see what the hunters wanted from me. Well, all right, the hunter who looked like Matthew McConaughey said. The others whooped with excitement. We're going to go bag ourselves a creature that doesn't even exist. Silent Owl took their money and went with them. I was horrified. The thought of Silent Owl leading them to the sacred lands, set aside for the forest people since the beginning of creation, was appalling and grotesque. I sat for a long time, feeling great woe and horror, knowing of the violation that those men planned to commit. My skookum grew weak inside me, and in its place rose up fear. I was truly afraid to do nothing, afraid of what would happen, Afraid on behalf of the peaceful and unsuspecting Bigfoot families that Silent Owl had betrayed, I resolved to go and to try and help them, to protect them if necessary. I am not a hunter of men, and the thought of turning my compound bow on a person and silently assassinating him frightened me. I was not sure where such a thought came from, but I could imagine having Silent Owl in my sights and putting an end to their expedition in just one shot. They might shoot back, but I would be long gone. I trembled, afraid of the consequences of murder, but I also realized I must be willing to do anything, or there was no point in going after them. I went home and called my dogs from the woods, Spritzer and Chief. They came to me, wagging their tails and to sniffed my hands, and sensed I was about to go on a big hunt, Spritzer growled. He didn't like my fear, but he obeyed me and got into the back of my truck. Chief seemed nervous, following me around while I packed. When I had my backpack ready, I took up my compound bow, a thirty-six caliber revolver, my hunting knife, and a survival hatchet. I loaded my truck with extra fuel and water and food for my dogs. For a long moment, I sat in the cab, in the muddy driveway of my trailer. It was a decision I had to choose to make. I could stop and do nothing, or I could take the warpath. We were soon off the highway and driving up an old dirt logging road, partially overgrown. I stopped at the creek and got out. We hiked the rest of the way up to where the road ends, and there we found the pickup that belonged to Matthew McConaughey and his buddies, and it was empty. They had already set out on foot up into the mountains. They had about six miles to hike before they were even at the edge of Bigfoot's territory. I followed them with fear of what they planned to do and fear of what I planned to do weighing in my mind. Old Raven found me and asked me, well, Where are you going? I ignored the creature and led my dogs. It grows dark in the forest before it is night, and I saw the campfire of Matthew McConaughey's hunting party, and I stopped and set up a cold camp. I fed my dogs and slept little, listening to the darkness and hearing the voices of the men as they bragged loudly. In the morning I waited until they left. I could have shot an arrow into the silent owl, but I was too afraid. We came to their camp, and I finished putting out their fire. The dripping pines weren't in danger of burning, but it annoyed me that they had littered and left their campfire smoking. My dog sniffed everywhere, sensing that we were hunting these men. They looked at me questioningly, and I said, I don't know either. I know this is strange, but I don't know how to turn back. When we reached the quiet mountain meadow where my grandfather had seen Bigfoot, I realized we were crossing the threshold. There was no turning back. We were entering into another world, an older and more civilized world. In this place... There was a balance between man and nature, and man wanted for nothing. They were hidden here, unseen by the cold and calculating eyes of science. I followed the tracks of the hunters easily, 
seeing how they blundered through the grass and bushes. The trees shed their dew like a soft rain, and birds who had never seen humans called to each other for the curious gossip of newcomers. I caught up to them and waited some distance away, crouching down and hidden. I thought to myself that if I was going to fire an arrow and put an end to this, that now would be the right time. All I could think about was them shooting back at me, chasing me, hunting me. I was frozen in fear, unable to take action. My dogs were growling softly as they too waited to strike. The hunting party moved on, and I followed them. We began to climb the side of the mountain, and I realized with anxiety that by now Bigfoot would know we were here. It occurred to me that I didn't need to do anything. If Bigfoot was disturbed by the intrusion, Bigfoot had great skookum, and he could fend for himself. I had told myself this and used it as an excuse to abandon my foolish pursuit of the hunters. Both of my opportunities to fire an arrow and end Silent Owl's betrayal had resulted in me paralyzed by fear. I knew I would do nothing. There was no point in me trying. So I told myself to let Bigfoot defend his own lands and to turn back. That is, when things became terrifying. My dog smelled something in the air they didn't like. Their loyalty to me shattered as I told them to stop and to stay, but they ran away, whimpering in terror. I turned, and soon I could smell Bigfoot, like rancid swamp water. The foul wind turned my stomach and drove a primal fear into me like a thorn. I looked up, my eyes watering, and saw a blurry image of one great hand curled around a tree at a monstrous height. The angry eyes, almost human, peered out at me from behind the wood. I shook and stood frozen, looking back at it. There was a low growl from the creature, and then it called out in a voice that was too much like the howl of a man. I fell to my knees and dropped my weapon. I put up my hands, covering my head. I looked down from it, my instincts commanding my movements. I wanted to survive, and I could sense its rage and its hostility. I prayed, my lips murmuring. Great Spirit, please show me his animal, friend. I meant no harm coming here. Forgive me. Teach this son of the forest I am not its enemy. Put compassion in its heart. Bigfoot looked at me and heard my frightened whimpering. It stared down on me for a long time, breathing heavily. It belted an enraged roar, but it did not lift me or harm me. I shook with terror, fearing for my life. Then the ground shook as it stomped away and left me there. My legs were shaking as I tried to stand, but my fear had overwhelmed me. I fell down, alone without my dogs, and lay staring up into the lit green canopy. I took a long time, but my skookum gradually built up inside me, and I decided to follow Bigfoot. I knew that if it thought I was an enemy, I would already be dead. On the ridge I saw the hunters. They had found Bigfoot tracks and were following them. The one who looked and sounded exactly like Matthew McConaughey was in the lead. Silent Owl was behind them. He was looking around, sensing that some hidden danger had him in their sights. This time I let my arrow fly. Silent Owl fell from the ridge, and the other hunters did not notice until he had plummeted to his death. I felt sorrow for my actions, but I knew it was just. He had led the hunters to Bigfoot, and in doing so, he had begun the killing that was to follow. Forgive me, brother. May you find peace with your loved ones on the other side. I spoke on behalf of Silent Owl, hoping that he would find forgiveness in death and be reunited with his family. For the hunters, death was not so kind or gentle. They found Bigfoot, or rather a band of four younger male Bigfoot found them. They were in a savage mood, having watched all the females and children of their tribe flee in terror. The older male Bigfoot had gone, too. I called out a warning, hoping they would run for their lives. I'd watched the Bigfoot flee before the hunters could find them, vanishing into the forest from the open mountain meadows below. The hunters looked to my position on the ridge, having heard my warning cry. One of them used his rifle scope to identify me. For a split second, I thought I'd be shot, but they knew nothing of my fault in Silent Owl's death. They never climbed down to his body to see the broken arrow. 
Then the Bigfoot attacked. Their first assault was a test of the strength of the intruders. They didn't kill any of them, but they left injuries and terror on the faces of the hunters. They fired their rifles at close range, but managed to miss with every shot. When the Bigfoot retreated, the hunters were too terrified to continue, all except Matthew McConaughey. I followed him as he set out alone, deep into Bigfoot territory. He was determined to slay Bigfoot and would not back down from their guerrilla antics. We came to a part of the forest that was very old, and great boulders were all that remained of some primeval mountain. Beneath the boulders were shallow caves. Each cave had the skeletal remains of a Bigfoot. We had entered their burial ground. Every Bigfoot that had ever died was brought to this place for countless generations. Going back to the very first day, I shuddered in dread of what the spirits would think of me for entering such a sacred place without right, without tribute. I took one last candid look at Matthew McAnaughey, where he was crouched and handling the skull of Bigfoot. I left him there and went back the way I had come. As I wandered back through the forest, I found the first of the fleeing hunters. Bigfoot had broken his neck. I gasped in horror at the sight, but I left his remains there. I had my own skin to save, and I wasn't out of the woods yet. I found the second hunter dead as well. The Bigfoot had relentlessly pursued them and killed at least two of them. I felt dread as I realized the Bigfoot were close, and they were killing every man in sight. Would I be hunted down and brutally slaughtered? I heard gunshots in the distance. I knew the Bigfoot had found the last hunter. I moved on slowly and cautiously. Night was falling, and I felt trepidation at the thought of camping or wandering in the dark. I pressed on, almost to the creek. There I found the last of the hunters. They had torn him to pieces and scattered him all over the place. His rifle was twisted and smashed. I felt sick as the last light was fading. I knelt at the small waterfall and threw up. When I arose, my panic grew to screaming heights as I saw I was surrounded by angry Bigfoot. I knew it was about to be all over. They would descend on me and tear off my arms and bite through my neck. I cowed at the sight of them and again fell to my knees. They were closing in on me when I heard a loud and almost chuckling grunting noise. I looked up and saw the massive old Bigfoot I'd first seen. He had come and seen me and was telling the others to let me go. The Bigfoot looked at their leader and then they backed away from me and left me there, shaking in terror. I fled through the forest, following the creek until I came to the old logging road. I took one look at Matthew McConaughey's abandoned vehicle, and I knew it would stay there and rust. Nobody was coming back from the hunting party. I walked toward my own vehicle, and when I got there, I tossed my backpack into the back. Chief looked up at me and whined. He had hidden there, waiting for my return. I called a spritzer, but he never came. With my heart heavy at his disappearance, I drove us back to the highway and took us home. That night I sat with my hands shaking and my nerves frayed. I had survived that my memories of what I had seen and how terrible it all was would linger in my mind forever. I would never have peace again. As I sat thinking about it, I wondered what had become of my other dog. Chief had come inside, having had enough of the woods. He sat miserable, missing his brother. As we sat staring at his empty place by the fire, I heard barking outside. I opened the door, and there he was. Spritzer had traveled all night and somehow found his way home. I was overjoyed, and some part of me began to feel hope. I realized the Bigfoot would again know the peace and isolation they needed to survive. They had let me go because they are not monsters, and they forgave me. Spritzer's return home was like a sign that in the end, all would be well. Hello, I'm a bus driver in a small town in England, and I think I've just picked up a passenger's soul on my bus. This happened two nights ago. I've worked with this bus company for eight half years, and I've driven the same route for three years. Over this time, I have gotten regulars that I've come to know as I see them multiple times a day, some young and some old. 
I take them to work or to the shops and bingo. I often jump out to help my older passengers with their shopping and whatnot. I've had a passenger that I've taken for the full three years I've done this route. Let's call her Jane. Jane is an elderly lady who suffers from dementia. She was well-functioning for the last two and a half years, sometimes a little confused, but I was always patient and helped her however she needed. I used to pick her up from the bus stop right outside her house, literally a ten-second walk from her door to the bus stop. Every day, I'd take her from her house to the local shopping center where she played bingo with friends. However, her dementia worsened in the last six months after an incident on my bus where she got very confused and distressed. I had to stop my bus and try to settle her down. Someone on the bus knew her son, who thankfully worked close by and came over to help. I told my manager, who understood and approved for my passengers to get off my bus and catch the next one just behind, so I could stay with Jane. Her son came, calmed her down, took her home and thank me for the help. We spoke about Jane, and I explained how we had become friendly over the last few years I'd been on the route. I explained she hadn't freaked out like this before. He said he knew, and she spoke fondly of me. Her dementia had worsened, causing her to have bad spells. He took my number and said he would get in touch to arrange a gift for looking after Jane. I insisted it was okay, and that I didn't want a gift, but he insisted. He took my number and his mother and left the bus. I never saw Jane again after that day, but I did see the son at the shops. He explained that Jane had gotten worse and unfortunately wasn't safe to leave the house. I thanked him for letting me know, wished her the best, and asked to be kept up to date with her condition as we had become friends over the years. This leads to last night. I had been covering the late night shift all week when around 11.30 p.m., I was driving by Jane's house. The bus was completely empty. But as I approached the stop, I thought of Jane as I normally do. For some reason, I had an urge to stop at the bus stop outside her house. Even though I could see there wasn't anyone waiting, the urge was so strong that I did. I opened the doors and waited for a second. A cold rush of air entered the bus, and I closed the doors and drove on. I could feel a presence on the bus. About five minutes later, or six stops down the road, I felt someone next to my cab on the bus, as if someone was waiting to get off. I stopped again and opened the doors. I felt the presence leave, and I again continued on, feeling a bit confused. I fully believe in the paranormal. So when I got a call this morning from Jane's son to tell me she passed away two nights ago in her home around 11 p.m., I broke down... I had forgotten about the strange feeling I had that night with a presence on my bus until the funeral. I took the day off and attended the funeral for Jane before going back to the son's house for the wake. The son's house was 30 seconds from the stop where I had let the presence off. I don't know if this is crazy or if I'm just being stupid, but I picked up a presence from right outside Jane's house 30 minutes after she passed and dropped it off at her son's house. Could I have taken Jane's soul on a final trip to see her son before she passed on to whatever is beyond? I really want to believe I did so. I have comfort in the idea that I drove her one last time to see her son one last time. Does anyone else have an experience like this? Thank you and sorry for the long read. When I was 12, we moved from Alaska to North Carolina. My mom didn't fly, so we bought a tiny camper and camped for two weeks going across Canada. We were having trouble with the brake lights, so we found a campground and pulled in. No one was at the gate to check us in, so we just parked close to the gate, thinking we'd pay once the host arrived. The first thing I did was take off on my bike around the loop. I noticed that every camper had a car beside it, but no people. There were no people anywhere. I rode back to get my mom to go to the bathroom with me because I was creeped out. My mom loved anything scary and also loved trying to scare me. There was a door in the bathroom that looked like it was like a janitor's closet. She flung the door open dramatically and, and screeched, trying to scare me only to realize it wasn't a closet but a set of stairs to a dark nowhere. 
She slammed the door closed, and we got out of there. Back at the camper, my mom was telling my dad about the door to nowhere, and he said that the toilet flushed beside him while he was in the bathroom, but no one else was in there with him. We had two dogs with us, and they would stretch their necks up and sniff the air and whine. It's getting to be dinner time. Still not one person. And my mom starts making up a story about how the campers are vampires, and they wait for new campers to come, and then they eat them. I shit you not as soon as the sun went behind the trees. Everyone came out of their campers. We packed up and got the hell out of there. My girlfriend and I had a cryptid sighting along Route 40, just north of Brookville. The sun was still up, just a little before sunset, with thin, high clouds, so there was plenty of light. I was driving, and she was looking at me as we were heading west on 40, engaged in conversation. Then I saw her eyes widen as she gazed past me through my window. She practically screamed, what the hell is that, and pointed across the field we were traveling parallel to. I looked to my left and saw something huge and black with a massive upper body running like a bat out of hell along the edge of the woods. She watched it for a good thirty seconds as it ran along the edge of the woods until we lost sight of it when we passed a house close to the road. She kept going on about it, half panicked and excited until we got home, which took about three, four minutes from the point of the sighting. Finally, we got home, and I asked her what she saw exactly. She described it as a big black thing that was running faster than any deer or human could move. It had a big upper body, but we couldn't see any major details due to the distance across the field. She said it was one of those things, wasn't it? After the encounter, I introduced her to the NADP site, but I also asked her if she had seen anything strange in that area before, like animals acting oddly or going missing and she confirmed that such incidents had occurred over time. So, this is my dogman sighting. On July 4th, 2012, at 2 p.m., I saw a dogman cross my path in front of my bicycle. This beast was only four feet away from me. Its snout was over a foot long with absolutely ferocious teeth. Where we typically have whites in the eyes, this one had yellow. The inner part of the eye was green and had a very piercing appearance. I would approximate this animal's weight to be about 220 pounds. This isn't late night hikers. It was my mom taking six-year-old me for a walk while we were camping in Washington back in the late 80s. We were Canadians on vacation and didn't know the area. It was just us, walking along the banks of the river at dusk and playing in the trees when I remember starting to feel. Weird, like someone was following us. I thought maybe my dad was playing games with us. Except it was pretty clear my mom felt the same way because she started hissing at me to walk faster and be quiet. The feeling got stronger and stronger and... Then I felt my mom grab my hand and tell me to run. We just kept running until we hit a road and flagged down a car who took this petrified mother and daughter to their campground. The name of the river? The Green River. They found another victim of the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway, a few weeks later, in the area where we were exploring. It has ruined my ability to walk through the woods by myself. The woods by where my father grew up have an old abandoned house, or houses, I should say, scattered throughout the woods. I'm from the Hudson Valley. Anyone from that area knows the woods there have old houses, or at least the foundations remaining. Anyway, when my father was younger, he and everyone else basically would climb up this mountain to an abandoned house. He said it had old black and white nudes, but a lot of kids would go up to smoke and hang out, so a lot of the things were just smashed. Part of the trip up the mountain basically involved climbing up a cliff, blanking on proper term, just a flat rock surface that you had to scale. This was also his usual way down. 
So one night he went up alone and was working his way down. Night was settling in, and as he was lowering himself down the drop-off, he felt an odd presence and glanced upwards towards where he was just standing. Basically, what he saw was a quick glance, because whatever it was just made him climb down the mountain and run home. He described it as basically very tall, lumbering above him and covered in hair. It wasn't a bear, at least from the glance he got. Normally, you'd take things to your parents and tell you if you have some doubt. But after a recent trip to his mother's and her sharing some of his stories that he told, it just made it more believable. There's also that hole you'll see what you want to see, so who knows. I'm terrified of heavily wooded areas, to be honest. I'm a pretty avid runner. I've been quitting a lot of bad habits, and exercise just does the trick for me. I have a greenway behind my house that I can run or bike on. It's very beautiful, and during the day, plenty of people are there. Well, about a week ago, I ran through the greenway to stop by a friend's house and grab something. By the time I got back onto the greenway, the sun was already starting to set, and the path was getting dark. As I was walking back through the path, I had my flashlight on and kept looking around me. I felt paranoid being alone in the dark. As I was walking, I distinctly remember hearing my grandma's voice call my name from the tree line. It sounded so real and normal that I turned around instantly, only to immediately go cold, realizing that my grandma is deceased. This freaked me out, but I tried my best to somewhat convince myself that I was just hallucinating because I was paranoid. Only about a minute later, I turned around behind me with my flashlight out of fear. That's when I saw it. It looked like a gray blob, pretty much like a human sprinting at me full speed in the pitch black. I screamed like a little scared child, and I don't think I've ever run so fast in my life. When I got home, I tried to laugh it off as me seeing things and being overly anxious. But about a week later, I can't stop thinking about it. It sounded so real. I heard her voice clear as day, and the person chasing me looked so real. I've heard all those stories about skinwalkers, and while I doubt their existence, my experience was so similar to that of skinwalker encounters that I'm seriously questioning myself. What do you guys think? Is it possible that my brain was just hallucinating out of fear and anxiety? In the early 1980s, I lived in a small town near the southwest part of the Chattahoochee National Forest in Georgia. I was hunting on public land in the National Forest, just up the road from home in an area known as Cooper's Creek. I've hunted in and around that area for years and was very familiar with the terrain. When I located a good spot that I thought would give me a good chance at a large buck, I set up my lock on tree stand about 12 feet off the ground. I was hunting with a 12-gauge shotgun, since rifle hunting is not allowed in this area. So fast forward to early November. I had been hunting in my tree stand several times. This particular hunt was during the late afternoon around 4.15 p.m. I wanted to get there earlier, but I was held up at work. This was a Friday afternoon, and my wife knew that I would not be home until 8.30 p.m. and even later if I had bagged a deer. I parked my truck at the trailhead and started hiking into the woods to my tree stand. The walk would take about 20 minutes. I moved slowly through the woods since I didn't want to spook any of the wildlife. As I was walking, I noticed how quiet it was. Eerily quiet. I finally arrived, climbed up and settled in. I began to survey my surroundings. I began to have a disconcerting feeling like somebody was watching me. I just felt like something was out of place. After a while, I kept looking at my watch, wondering how much time I had left until dusk. I thought that I should leave early because of how I was feeling. Then, I caught movement to my right side. I slowly turned my head and began looking through the tree canopy. That's when I saw it. I honestly don't know what it was. I was staring into the trees, and I saw what looked like a large human body, but it was completely blurred. 
It was moving through the trees. I could clearly see the outline of the figure, but the rest was all blurry. I couldn't focus on it. It resembled an out-of-focus blob of gelatin that was in the shape of a human. Whenever it would stop moving, I completely lost sight of it as it blended into its surroundings. I continued to watch it stop and then start moving. I do so for about 15 minutes. By that time, I was starting to become scared as I was thinking about my walk back to the truck. So I waited for another 15 minutes or so. It was getting dark by then, so I slowly climbed out of my stand. Once I hit the solid ground, I wasted no time. I sprinted all the way back to my truck. I quickly jumped into the cab. I just sat there in my truck and tried to regain my breath. I drove home and said nothing to my wife or anybody else for several weeks. During that time, I tried to convince myself that I had imagined the whole thing. I eventually told my wife one night. She listened and said that it was probably my imagination. I later told my brother, who said something similar to my wife. I never told anyone else. I never hunted in those woods again. I didn't even go back for the tree stand. I took a break from hunting for about five years. I then started up again, but never in that area. I still wonder what I saw that day. I have no rational explanation. Years later, I think in 1988, the movie Predator was released. When I saw the cloaked alien on the screen, I immediately tensed up in fear. That is what I saw. I was shocked. Did I encounter an alien? I still wonder what it was that I saw that day. I no longer hunt or spend much time in the woods. I saw a thing in or near the woods on three separate occasions now. Each time I saw the thing, it was in a different state along the east coast of America, and each time the sighting was fleeting. I'm in my 30s now, and the sightings have several years between them. The first time I saw it was in high school, and this is most definitely the time I got the longest look at it. The second time I only caught a glimpse, and I'm pretty sure but not entirely sure. It was the same thing. The third time, I got a clear look at it from a distance, but it caught me so off guard that I stumbled as I was taking a step, and I lost sight of it. I've been calling it a thing because I have no idea what it is, and quite honestly, I don't even have a good guess either. It was not a Sasquatch, a wild man, a rake, a lizard person, or any other creature I have found through my incredibly frustrating recent internet research on the subject matter. Maybe a shapeshifter of some kind, because the first time I saw it, the thing changed its form, for sure. Yes, I said it changed its form. You can go ahead and leave now if you like. If you are someone like me who will rely on science for validation, you try to keep an open mind, but you also tend to explain away people's paranormal encounters for any number of different reasons. Also, I would have expected that if I ever did end up seeing something otherworldly, it might be something that someone else had seen before, right? This post is the first time I have put any of this out there to anyone, and if it weren't for this last encounter, I would have forgotten the first two again. I have never mentioned this to anyone because of how ridiculous it sounds. The fact that I have no proof. I'm pretty much exactly the person you would think might make something like this up. At this point, though I only want to get this off my chest to hopefully find out if anyone else has ever seen this thing. Before I begin telling you what happened, I would like to make it clear that I swear what you read here is the truth about what I saw as best as I can remember. If you don't believe it, fine, whatever, I get that. This is the reason I am posting what happened here, and it is the reason that I have never, and will never, told anyone I might have to see in my daily life. I'm sure they would think I'm crazy or just desperate for attention because what I saw is downright absurd. Well, now that I have thoroughly destroyed any credibility I may have once had, I will tell you what I saw as best as I can. I have been thinking about exactly how I might explain this to someone for a while now, so I will do my best to keep out of a narrative tone. Well, now that I have thoroughly destroyed any credibility I may have once had, 
I will attempt to explain the details about what I saw as bluntly as possible with as vivid of a recollection as I have of the events. 1. First Sighting, Southern New Hampshire, 2000 or 2001 summer probably, I don't remember exactly when, well after midnight. I'm going to take some time to explain this first encounter in as much detail as I can recall even though it all happened so fast, literally lasting in total maybe 10 seconds. It is still the longest amount of time I have spent truly looking at the thing. I was walking to a friend's house from the apartment complex I lived in late at night. To get from one place to the other quickly, you had to cut through a small patch of forest, roughly 100 yards. That was technically someone else's property. A couple of times before we had someone shine a light on us, and once he fired a shot in the air to try and scare us in an attempt to get us to stop cutting through, but it never did stop us. It did, however, teach me to be stealthier when cutting through, and so on this night. I was creeping very quietly through the trees as I went. The forest was in a valley between my apartment complex. Some houses in the neighborhood where my friend lived. The valley dipped down in the middle with a steep incline surrounding it, and so at first. I had to go down into the valley, and then at the end I would walk up out of the valley, exiting the tree line right onto the street where his house is. Once exiting the tree line, one would be standing on the side of the street with the end of the road about half a mile to your right and the entrance to the neighborhood about the same distance on the left. The houses were spaced apart decently, so the night was very dark except for the area around the houses and a couple of light circles under the orange street lights, of which there were very few for the amount of space. I got through the valley with no problem this time, and I got up some speed to go up the hill in front of me where the forest ended, maybe five feet from the edge of the street if the event was that far. At the exact moment, I came out of the tree line and onto the edge of the road. Something caught my eye to the left of me emerging from the woods across the street. It stumbled awkwardly out of the dark woods and into view right at the edge of the circle of orange light radiating down from one of the street lights. At first, and for just a brief moment, it looked like a shadow. However, I heard a sound coming from the dead leaves beneath its feet, and I quickly realized that it was not a shadow. Its body shape was like that of a starving child, maybe three feet tall, that you might see in a third world country, but its legs and arms were so thin that there appeared to be no way it could support the creature's body weight. It was dark, but from what I can remember, at the ends of its frail-looking limbs were just nubs. No hands and no feet that I saw. Its movements were the creepiest part, honestly, and they were the first thing that threw me off. I can't even really explain how absurd and unnatural its movements were, or how it was standing on those tiny legs. It moved forward from the trees and toward the street extremely awkwardly with a couple of steps that I saw it take. It was almost as if it was not supposed to be walking around like that, but it had somehow figured out a way to do so regardless. The thing was roughly two or three feet tall with an enlarged light bulb, shaped head and a little belly despite how thin the rest of its frame was. In addition to its shape and motion, the thing seemed unreal, mostly because it didn't seem to reflect any light at all when it stepped into the light of the street lamp. It appeared to have no three-dimensional form at all, with its body almost blending right into its shadow, and I could only really tell it had solid form by the way that it moved and navigated the environment around it. I froze in place instantly when I saw it with my brain, unable to even process what I was seeing. In a couple of steps it exited the trees, stumbled across the patch of grass to the street, and then sort of fumbled down forward toward a sewer drain on the side of the road. I'm not sure what I did, if anything, but as soon as it hit the curb, it rose back up and looked over at me. I couldn't see its face or anything at all, still just this bizarre black shape moving so unbelievably awkwardly. I really can't stress this enough. Its movements were ridiculously uncoordinated. What happened next is what sent me fleeing into the woods with all of the cowardice that has kept me alive to this day.
upon seeing me, this malformed shadow child thing did this quick twisted turn toward me, dropping down to all fours and becoming a much more animal-like shape when it did. I again have no idea how to describe the motion as it was so unnatural, but when its turn was complete, the thing had become something I can only describe as a shadow dog or cat or bear. I know that sounds crazy, but I can't describe it any other way than that. It stood on all fours like a predatory animal, but I couldn't make out any definition on it with the way it didn't catch the light that it was standing directly below. This thing didn't just go from being human, like to being a human on all fours. I mean, it genuinely became something else, as far as I can tell. I debated leaving this next part out because it just slices into the credibility of the events even further. But it happened, and so here it goes. As soon as the creature had hit all fours and was no longer humanoid, its eyes flashed yellow at me, and it let out a loud shriek. Not a growl, not a bark, not a snarl, not an animal-like roar, or even a hissing, but a legitimate shriek that sounded like neither a person nor an animal. The sound started quietly, then rose quickly, almost as if it was winding up or under pressure and had just painfully been forced out of the creature's mouth in great anguish. Its scream had a certain harshness to it, as if it might have had something seriously wrong with its vocal cords, or it had just smoked a million cigarettes consecutively. I remember the thing had a weird, almost scared vulnerability to the sound it made which contrasted the harshness and tone as well as the defensive stance the creature took. All this took place in just a few seconds, maybe ten at most, from the time the thing exited the tree line to the time it turned, postured, shrieked at me, and sent me running without a single thought in my head right back into the wood. I did not stop. I did not look back. I did not try to be quiet through the forest. I just ran as fast as I could. That is correct. I was so scared I ran back into the dark, scary woods to get away, only realizing how dumb that was some time afterward. The sound it made chilled me to my core then, but now in hindsight I think the flashing eyes bother me more than the sound because it seemed so expected. The flashing or glowing eyes trope is precisely what I've heard in so many other people's stories. I never believed about mysterious creatures they claimed to have encountered. I mean, because that is what scary things in the night do right. They flash yellow eyes and make a scary shrieking sound at you. Obviously, what else would they do? I never made it to my friend's house that night, and I never mentioned this to anyone ever since. I managed to forget about this experience pretty quickly, though. I'm not sure how my life was high drama at the time, so I'm sure it is because I did something stupid, and that took over my world. 2. Second Sighting, Central Florida, 2006 Spring, I believe. Early night, 8 p.m. The second sighting is much briefer, and as I mentioned before, I'm 90% sure it was the same thing, but I'm not entirely sure. I'll keep this short and tell you simply that I was out camping went for a walk along a trail and watched my girlfriend hop from rock to rock across the river. I heard a sound to my left, and when I turned to look, I saw an extremely thin, skinny, black, nubbed leg, possibly a tail, disappear behind a tree as if an animal running away from something. I ran over this time, but I found nothing, and I didn't mention it to my girlfriend. No experiences or weird sounds that night, and no more encounters for several years. If you like more detail about this one, you can attempt to email me with any questions, and I will try to remember. 3. Third Sighting, Eastern Shore of Virginia, June 8, 2019, late night, 11 p.m. Well, finally, here it is, the reason I felt I had to put this out there, and the reason I am so freaked out by this thing. It's not so much what happened last week as it was another quick glimpse and nothing else, but instead it is the fact that it happened again to me, and as far as I know, no one else. Last week I was at a party at a friend's house celebrating her birthday because she is one of those people in their thirties that still gets excited about those things. I don't drink, so I was not drunk, but 
in the interest of total transparency, I had been known to partake in the occasional medicinal herbal supplement for recreational purposes. You can take that information however you like. My friend lives with her husband in a farmhouse surrounded by open fields for a couple of acres in any direction, surrounded, of course, by a thick forest. I had been there for a while, and the thing was the furthest thing from my mind. We were all just hanging out and rambling on about the usual inane bullshit. I decided that I wanted to smoke, and so I went out the front door and onto the porch. I stepped forward and went to step down the front steps to get a little more space, and as I did, I glanced up and out into the field in front of the house. There it was, roughly fifty yards out and bumbling through the field toward the trees. For a split second, I could see the unmistakable shape of this weird shadow child thing. It was just the same as before. Large head and belly, unbelievably thin arms and legs, and again reflecting absolutely no light at all. I was mid-step when I glanced up and lost track of where I was stepping, causing me to fall forward. I managed to catch myself as I fell barely, and I must have made a sound when I did it, because when I looked back up, the thing was on all fours, quickly running like a dog off into the woods. I reiterate this thing did not move on all fours like a person in any way, but it moved like an animal with knees bent backward. I was too far away, and it happened too fast for me to tell if it had hands and feet this time. I started to walk out and look around a bit when someone came outside, and not wanting to tell anyone, I just went back to the party. I must have been distant the rest of the night, because I couldn't get it out of my head this time. I ended up leaving the party relatively early and went home to start obsessing about it, as I have been for about a week now. So I am sufficiently freaked out by a lot of things about what I have seen. Even discounting the second sighting, I got two brief but good looks at something that I cannot explain. One of the things that bothers me the most about this is, why me? Why, as far as I know, have I been the only one to see this thing? If it knows of me and is following me, or something like that, then why does it seem surprised by my presence each time I've seen it, and then enter a sort of fight-or-flight mentality? If it doesn't know of me, then why am I the only one to see this thing, and now in three different states, years apart? I have so many questions. I'm writing this over a few days to make sure I've got all the details as best as I can remember, and I hope I'm not the only one that saw this creepy thing. What I saw that night was so unnatural I never expected to see anything like it in my life. It honestly just did not belong in our physical reality, and it almost did not even seem to fit in the environment around it as if it was something 2D superimposed into an authentic 3D background. I looked into shadow people videos and sightings, but I don't think this was that, as there was nothing ghostly about what I saw. It was there and had solid form. It was so out of place, but at the same time I saw it there and heard it as well. I don't know what else to say about it. Each time, except the second, I could see enough of it that I could tell it was not somebody messing with me, and I could see enough of it to say it did not belong here in this world with us. My best guess at this point is that it and I crossed each other's paths in a possible interdimensional rift or time, slip only because of how surreal the experience was. I know that sounds crazy, but it is all I've come up with to rationalize the fact that this thing did not fit into its surroundings in any way. It did not even look like it was made to move and get around in this world. The force of gravity should have, for sure, crushed its skinny legs under the weight of its body. It was like an eggplant on toothpicks. That is all that it is for me to tell, but I sincerely hope someone else saw something like this, so I know I am not starting to lose it. At this point, I only want to know that I am not alone, and that what I saw has some explanation, rational or not. I don't even care, please. Just give me something to go on. I need one reasonable answer from somewhere at this point, because I know what I saw, and I can't get the way this thing moved or how dark it was out of my head.
During my spring break of 1977, my family and three other families from the neighborhood, I grew up and traveled to a Holiday Inn in Navarre Beach. My mother had told me it was a newly opened hotel. It had an indoor pool, arcade, gift shop, deli, and small movie theater. For its day, it was considered to be a very nice place, and my family went to this hotel three times. During our second visit in August of 1977, the film Jaws, I, I was being filmed at Navarre, and I even got to see the mechanical Jaws stored with other movie equipment and props in the eastern portion of the hotel parking lot. During the spring break vacation around late March of 1977, there was a special showing of the film Bugsy Malone, which only children were permitted to attend. It was during the film that I started to feel a bit disoriented. I heard some other children crying, and I heard the sound of someone throwing up. At one point in the film, I got up from my chair to leave, but I was quickly escorted back to my chair by an usher in a black suit and black hat. I saw one or maybe two more men in black suits at the back of the theater. After the film was over, I felt just fine, and I never did complain to anyone about that experience. One evening on this vacation, I awoke and sat up in my bed. I looked across the room and could see a group of small figures in the dimly lit room. My brother was asleep to my right, and my parents were asleep in the bed to my left. The feeling I felt was something I had felt before, which I immediately recognized. It was a feeling I only felt when the greys were near. I thought, it's been a while, and to a young boy about to turn seven, it had been over two years since his last encounter with the greys. So it had felt like a long time. But then I could not move, and one of the figures moved towards me very fast, and the last thing I recalled was its big black eyes very close to my face and a wand, like object being pointed at me. Then there was blackness. The next thing I recall was being in the sand dunes away from the hotel in a circle of children. I must have been one of the youngest because I was the shortest. But my attention was more on the blue object directly over us that had a glowing blue light all about it. The closest thing I've seen to this shade of blue would be that of the blue glow of Cherenkov radiation that I've only seen in photos. Then there was blackness. The next morning was a Saturday, and I was watching cartoons. It was not till I was watching TV that I recalled that night's experience with the greys and seeing the blue glowing sphere above me and the other children. I then told one of the other children who were traveling with us on this trip about my experience that night, and she did not believe me. I also recall walking around the hotel later that day and then getting up the nerve to tell my older brother who also teased me. I need some outside perspective to make sense of this because I am at a loss. I can't quite remember how old I was, maybe five-ish. I have this super vivid memory and I can't quite make sense of it. My mom just brought it up tonight and it was crazy hearing it from her perspective. One night when I was around five, we had some family friends come over with their kids. We had an underground room beneath the house that was like a basement or spare bedroom area. All of us kids loved playing in the downstairs room. That night, we built a fort with some mattresses and blankets. The family friends went home later that night, and I remember my mom tucking me into bed. We had a whole good night routine for all of my teddies so they didn't feel left out. I fell asleep in my bed. I woke up later in the night because I felt cold. I was in the blanket fort in the downstairs room. I bolted awake. I was so scared of the dark and was so confused as to how I got there. The downstairs room had a bit of an eerie vibe on a good day. In this night, it was so dark and cold. I felt like I was being watched and closed in on, like the same panic you get when you run up the stairs quickly at night. I bolted out of the downstairs room up to the ground level where the backyard was and then up the back stairs to the back door. I was sobbing, screaming, and pounding at the back door. I woke my whole house up, my parents and sister. My parents rushed to the door to unlock it. 
They double-checked the door, and windows and everything was closed and locked. Everything locks from the inside. My mom brought it up tonight, and we've talked about it before a bit in the past, but I asked her what she remembered. She put my sister and me into bed. She said she woke up to me banging on the back door and screaming. My parents got me inside and tucked me in again after a lot of comfort and snuggles. My mom said she was sure she tucked me into bed and that. She has no idea how or why I got outside when the whole house was locked. Also, I would never do that as a five-year-old. The house we were living in at the time had a bit of spiritual presence. Real, weird, unexplainable things that have happened, but nothing scary or malicious just making themselves known, or residual haunting. It's only happened once or so each time, but we had unexplainable and very clear footsteps, knocking full-body apparitions, and other weird things happened. I did sleepwalk a bit as a child, maybe an explanation, but also, how did I get out of the house when all the doors and windows were locked and could only be locked from the inside? There is no way I had the cognitive ability to lock up after myself or have a house key and the windows locked from the inside at five years old. For my own sanity, I have been trying to make sense of this because the alternative is a real kick in the pants. I'm thinking more of a paranormal experience, which is you and also all. So my question for you is, what the heck happened? How could I have gotten out of the house and ended up in the mattress fort we had built in the downstairs room? Do you have other theories or questions as to what happened to me? Please help. I was a keen sailor once I was out snorkeling in the Whit Sundays, having a blast checking out Nemo and all his mates, just floating about in the zone, as it were. Well, that zone was rudely interrupted when I suddenly realized I was surrounded by a swarm of jellyfish all around me out of the blue. What the F, Australia? Naturally, I freaked out, but some sort of survival instinct kicked in. Otherwise, I probably would have drowned myself in a flumux. I just gently, carefully floated the F out of there and then sped back to the boat. Honestly, it was rather horrific, even if it doesn't sound that bad. One time when I was in middle school, my dad had a boat and we were going out to deep sea fish in the waters between Mexico and California. We saw about three aircraft carriers and a couple other ships all surrounding this area of about five miles. We didn't know what it was, but we continued to go out to fish and then a couple hours later we heard the loudest boom I've ever heard in my life. We looked around and spotted an aircraft carrier, and my first thought was that they were firing a missile at us. Law. Then while we were heading back to the docks, we started to see TVs, dressers, and other random things floating in the water. We actually caught an El Dorado hiding under the dresser, too. Haha, <laughs> but anyways, we found out it was when the United States captured one of the biggest drug cartel leaders in the Coast Guard and military was bringing him to the United States on boat, and then an aircraft carrier blew the drug cartel leader's boat up when we heard the loud boom, which explains everything once we found that out. But that was the creepiest thing I've seen out there. We went sailing in the British Virgin Islands for a vacation when I was 16 with another family, two sets of parents, myself, and their 13-year-old, for 10 days on a 30-ish foot sailboat. I can't remember. It felt small. I am terrified of swimming in water where I can't see the bottom, but there it was, crystal clear. It was halfway through our trip and we went to visit and snorkel the wreck of the Rhone, which looked just under the water from the surface, but was actually pretty far down. The water started to get too choppy for my taste, and seeing the scuba divers and huge tarpon fish, harmless, was making me uneasy, so I told everyone I was going back to the boat. They all decided to follow to our mooring. 
When I got close to the boat, I noticed something under the boat. The keel part of the boat has always scared me for some reason, too, so I try to avoid looking at it. As I get closer, the rest of the crew following me, I realize it is a five barracuda. This thing is nasty and just hanging under the keel like it wasn't moving. Of course I knew they were dangerous, but I also had on jewelry, a belly ring, 90s, and a shiny gold swimming suit. I stop dead, everyone else gathers behind me, and a few of us surface to decide how we will approach the ladder of the boat, while the rest watch said fish for movement. Being that I had tons of adrenaline and was a competition swimmer, I offered myself up first. I swam the fastest I've ever swam and pulled myself up as fast as I could, looking it directly in the eye until I surfaced. The rest of the crew not quite as nimble as I am. I'm pretty sure there was some rum involved. Hung back. The fish didn't move, so one by one, they frantically swam to get on the boat. That fish did not get to taste any of our crowd. It didn't stop there. The water started to get even more choppy. I had on a motion. Sickness patch because I had never been on a sailboat so long, so I was okay. But suddenly tropical storm warnings start to come across the radio as a giant gray cloud closes in. It went from a beautiful tropical day to hell within 15 minutes. We scrambled inside, life vests, radioing as they rushed to take down the sails. Suddenly a gust of wind took the main sail and almost dipped the entire boat sideways. The mast was within feet of the water. My decision to swim back to the boat early, Barracuda and all, proved to have been almost intuitive. For the next few hours, there was zero visibility in the scariest moments of my young life. We were no longer moored, so they just took down the sails, faced the bow into the wind, and basically motored in place. We couldn't see the islands, any other ships. Just pelting rain and the boom of the hull hitting trough of each wave. They had to take turns steering because it was blinding and disorienting and took turns riding out the storm inside. I don't remember how high they said the waves were, but I remember feeling a sense of imminent death. When I'm afraid, I mean petrified. I shut down and everything happens in slow mo. With each wave, it felt like the boat went flying up into the air on the crest, then a moment of flying feeling, then crashing down so hard that I was sure the hull of the boat was going to split open. This went on for hours. So to paint the picture, I'm just sitting at the table holding on for dear life and dodging falling unsecured items in my life jacket. The 13-year-old is screaming and crying. We are going to die over and over in different ways. My mother has her head in the garbage can and is holding on, trying to throw up, until finally her fear kicks in and things start coming out of both ends every time she heaves. Then I'm consoling her that it's okay. The three others are coming in and out for breaks. Each time we can see that it looks more and more like a hurricane outside. Eventually, I find my composure, yell at the girl to shut the F up because she isn't helping anyone, and move some towels under around my mom and try to help her clean up while she cried, which she was trying desperately to console me but was too seasick to get a word in. But she knew I was emotionally mature enough to do the best I could to take charge. It felt like hours of near death, up and down, silence, then crash, flying then, feeling the boat would crack, over and over, while everyone else is screaming at each other. Finally, hours later, it just stops. Dead calm. We see we are approaching an island, Virgin Gorda or Peter Island. I can't remember, and as if nothing happened, we pull up into the marina on a calm and quiet sea. None of us talk really until our feet hit the dock, except my mother, whom I helped shower off and clean up. We cheered, hugged, laughed. I finally cried, and we walked ashore to get the F away from that boat for a while. We found a gorgeous bath facility attached to the marina and showered and basked in light of being alive. We asked what is the nicest restaurant here, and were directed to this small, quaint place right on the water. We ate and drank. I was legal there, 
ordered giant plates of delicacies, and just laughed in wonder about how happy we were to be alive, no crashing into anyone or an island, drifting running out of fuel, boat breaking in half, being swept away or drowning. We were happy to be alive, though I haven't been on a single hull sailboat since. I prefer catamaran style now, I guess. I wanted to take the time to describe a terrifying experience that I recently had during my travels for work. To this day, logic still defies the events that transpired, and they have haunted me ever since. I am still afraid to stop my car at highway rest areas to this very day. I recently landed a position in sales with a very solid company in the medical device industry. Being in my mid-twenties, I am thrilled to work for such an innovative company. The money is great, the job is fun, and hell, they even gave me a company vehicle. That's a great perk. The only downside to the job is that my sales territory is quite expansive and covers several states, and because of budget constraints, they expect me to drive to most of my customers. I could not complain, however. Not many people my age get these kinds of opportunities. I finished up my work day at a hospital in central Pennsylvania when I received a phone call from a clinic in western New York that wanted to place a buy for my products, but before they could do so, they wanted a product demo. Not wanting to lose the opportunity, I agreed to be there by 9 a.m. My GPS showed the trip to be five hours if I took a highway that cut through the Allegheny Forest. Being that it was now 5 p.m., I figured that I could make the drive now since I had a bag packed with extra scrubs, toiletries, and product manuals from my current trip. I headed to a gas station, filled my SUV, purchased some snacks and two energy drinks, and hopped on the single-lane highway north towards New York State. It was the middle of November and quite cold, with the sun setting early and giving way to darkness in the late afternoon. By the time I had started my drive, it was already dark. Thick clouds were obscuring the moonlight. A wall of trees surrounded my vehicle on both sides, making it seem that I was driving my SUV through a tunnel of wood in darkness. The headlights from my vehicle, illuminating the staggered white line separating. The lanes of the highway were the only source of light. The drive definitely took on an ominous feel. I thought nothing of it as I slugged back my energy drinks and listened to some comedy podcast to pass the time. When I was about two hours into my drive, the inevitable happened when one has had large amounts of caffeine and a belly full of gas station snacks. I had to find a restroom eventually, which I was oak with, since I wanted to get out of the car and stretch my legs anyway. I had passed a small town about 15 minutes back, and I knew that I would need to find another one and pull off the highway or see if there was a rest stop anywhere ahead. Almost as if fate had heard me beckoning, I saw a sign that said rest area two miles. This is my lucky night, I thought, as I realized that I would not have to resort to relieving myself in the middle of the woods on a dark and creepy night. I came upon the rest area, which was located right off of the side of the highway. It was nothing like the rest areas one is used to encountering on major highways. There were no restaurants or vending machines. There was a single lonely picnic table and a garbage can on a patch of grass and two separate brick buildings with brown metal roofs on them. A single overhead street lamp barely illuminated my oasis as it was flickering on and off probably from neglect considering how remote this place was and how little use it was getting. The building to the left housed the ladies' restrooms, while the one to my right housed the men's restrooms. I placed my car in park in one of the ten available spots in front of the buildings and grabbed my phone to keep me entertained while I took care of business. As I walked on the narrow concrete walkway towards the restrooms, I caught a glimpse of something in the woods behind the rest area. It was still quite dark outside, and the overhead light provided too little illumination to discern what I was looking at. All I could see at that distance was an obscure black shape shifting through the thick trees. 
It could have simply been my eyes playing tricks on me since I'd spent the better part of the day either in a brightly lit operating room or driving down a pitch-black highway. I shrugged my shoulders and made my way into the men's room. There were three stalls at the far end of the restroom, flanking three urinals. Two flimsy overhead lights with exposed bulbs were the only sources of light. One of the panels had a bulb completely out, and the other was flickering sporadically, making the entire room look like it was lit by strobe lights in a nightclub. Just perfect, I thought. I'm stuck in the creepiest bathroom in the world, and I can barely see anything. I decided not to make a big deal about it. I'd be back on the road shortly. I took the stall in the middle. I had no reason why. I'd simply just randomly selected it. I sat down and nearly jumped from how cold the seat was. This was becoming quite an annoyance. At that moment, I had no idea, but things were about to get a whole hell of a lot worse. As I was in the midst of doing my business, the lights went out. Of all the times that this pathetic single tubular bulb could have called it quits, it had to do so when I was using a restroom in one of the most isolated spots in the state. You've got to be kidding me, I groaned out loud. At this point, the light from my phone was the only source of light cutting through the shroud of darkness that crept over the entire room. It was only at this point that I realized how quiet it had been this entire time. Aside from sound of the slight breeze outside hitting the building, it was dead silent. I sat there in silence, playing games on my phone when I first heard it. At first it sounded like a faint shuffling sound, the obscure noise of someone or something making its way towards the entrance of the restroom. I found this rather odd because I would have heard another vehicle pull up since the parking lot was right across from the two buildings. The shuffling then became more discernible. It was footsteps. Slow, trudging footsteps were making their way into the restroom. By how loud they were, whoever or whatever this was had entered the room. As the footsteps continued, I noticed that they were making a slapping sound against the tile floor. It was as if this person, or a thing, was barefoot. The footsteps became heavier and louder, and I noticed that they were moving towards the stalls. I locked my phone screen and sat there frozen with fear. My heart was pounding out of my chest and sweat started to creep across my brow despite the chill in the air. By this point, along with the heavy slapping footsteps, I heard the breathing. This thing's breathing was too otherworldly to be human. It took long, heavy, animal-like breaths and exhaled in a way that resembled an asthmatic with a faint whistle at the end. I had never heard such a thing. By this point, my bowels were completely voided from fear, and I was grateful that I had been sitting on a toilet, for I would have shut my pants had I not been. This foreboding presence continued to trudge towards me until I heard its heavy breaths right outside the door to the stall. In the pitch-black restroom, all I could hear was this thing breathing a mere few feet away from me. Now certain that it was aware of my presence, my heart continued to pound as I heard it shuffle around outside of the stall. I had never felt so helpless in my life. I was trapped here at the mercy of this creature. After what I imagined was several minutes, the breathing quieted down some. I had pulled my feet up and I was squatted on the toilet in fear of this thing seeing me. I knew that it was still there, but for whatever reason, call it curiosity or perhaps a fear. Induced lack of judgment, I took out my phone and flicked up the flashlight app and pointed it at the floor. Underneath the stall door entrance, I nearly dropped my phone in horror at what I saw. Two massive feet were pointed straight at me. They were unbelievable large, too large to be human. The tops of them were covered with a matted brown and gray hair, while the toes were a pale purplish colored flesh with toenails that were long, ragged, and yellow. I barely had time to notice the grotesque feet of this creature when it took notice of the light and let out a monstrous growl that shattered the silence of the pitch-black room. It sounded like a growl that came straight from hell. It was a primal, guttural, inhuman voice. The noise was deafening. 
My terror had completely overtaken me as I fell onto the floor and prepared to meet my doom at the hands of this beast. I closed my eyes as I heard it begin to pound on the door, cracking noises indicating that it was getting closer on every strike to breaking the stall open and getting its probably equally grotesque hands on me. Just when I thought that I was a dead man, the monster had quieted down and ceased its assault on the stall door. I opened my eyes. I was still alive, for now. It was then that I heard another familiar sound from the other side of the room. Those heavy, slapping footsteps. Jesus Christ, there are two of them, I thought as terror pierced every muscle in my body as I lay limp on the floor. I heard the second set of footsteps grow closer, slap. 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 As I prepared to meet my fate, where I'd no doubt be torn in half by two forest beasts, that's when the face-off happened. Both creatures began to growl at each other back and forth as if locked in some sort of display of alpha male aggression. After several exchanges, they made their move. I heard the sound of flesh hitting flesh and bodies slamming up against the walls. I flicked my flashlight app back on and pointed it towards the noise as I looked from under the stall. The two creatures were locked in a life-and-death melee. They were growling inhumanly as they pushed each other back and forth, blood spilling onto the floor from what I imagined was them clawing and biting at each other in this life-and-death struggle. As their battle continued, one began to back away out of the entrance to the men's room, and the other followed in a frantic sprint. I still heard their inhuman growls as their battle continued outside, until their voices trailed off into a barely audible drone in the woods. As terrified as I was, I got to my feet and exited the stall. I pointed the light from my phone and against the floor. There was dark red blood and tufts of grayish-brown fur all over the floor. It looked like someone field dressed an animal carcass in here. The stench was unbearable. It smelled like the inside of an animal cage at the zoo. What the hell were these things? I was not going to stick around and find out. I sprinted back to my car, entered, slammed the door shut, and peeled out of the parking lot like I was in a street race against death. My truck tires screeched as I careened out of the entrance and back onto the highway. I was covered in sweat and hyperventilating having narrowly escaped a horrible death at the hands of some primal beasts from a forgotten era. I sped the rest of the way to my destination in New York. I arrived and checked into a hotel. I sat at the bar and downed several scotches before even dropping my bags in the room. My rattled nerves settled down eventually and I made my way to my room. I lay on the bed sleepless but sure of two things. I was not taking that route back home, and I was never stopping at a rest stop ever again. I remember walking out of my mother's room two years ago. I saw at the end of the hallway, out of the corner of my eye, a black figure walking straight into my room. Terrified me. I could go on and on about these stories and similar ones, so comment specifically if you want me to respond with more. A couple days later, my then-boyfriend came over. Very Christian. Didn't believe in ghosts, told me all the time. Would make jokes and try to scare me because it humored him. I walked him out to his car as he was leaving that night. He seemed freaked out and went home kind of quickly. He FaceTimed me once he got home and said, I'd I didn't want to freak you out, but I saw a black figure in your window staring at us while we were outside. My mom sensed a horrible energy when I got home, too. I never told him about the black figure I saw because I assumed he would make fun of me or try to scare and get a riot out of me. In May, my best friend's wife offered to fly me out as a surprise for our birthdays, which are two days apart. They just had a baby, and she thought it would be a fun relief. They live on the second floor of a huge brownstone in one of the oldest parts of the city, right near the Alaclini Cemetery. I've worked in many haunted kitchens and have seen things, but never actually had contact. I'm also very sensitive to the veil and very intuitive so I think I tend to attract wandering energies. 
I also have night terrors, which have gotten a lot less frequent since I went to a psychic, and usually my partner is there to wake me up if I am trying to scream. So, the first night I was there, I was sleeping on a pad in the living room with the door open, my friends in their bedroom with the baby and the door closed. I was lying on my back and started having a nightmare, but it was different. It felt like there was something at the end of my feet waving its hands in my face like the jester thing from a jack. In your box playing the uh, I'm not touching you game like a child. Like usual, I struggled to wake myself up and tried to say something like, please leave me alone, but I just ended up yelling incoherently and bolting up. I was embarrassed that I screamed out loud in the middle of the night in a house with a newborn and thought I'd have to apologize in the morning. And also, of course, ask about ghosts. I drifted back to sleep but again felt another presence and woke up to see a figure standing above me in a plaid black and white shirt, thinking it was my friend who I must have woken up. I pulled myself up on my elbows. I called out his name, which coincidentally is actually Casper. Sorry if I woke you up. The figure's energy seemed kind of mischievous. I thought I felt a smile, if that makes sense. The figure bent down, picked up a small plush toy, and threw it at my face. It hit me, without a doubt. Hit me in the face. I yelled what the actual F and grabbed my phone, still thinking it might have been Casper trying to wake me up so I'd stop screaming. Turned on a light. No Casper and nothing near my head that resembled a small plush toy. I said a few prayers and went back to sleep. The next morning, I asked his wife, Bailey, if I woke them up and if the house was haunted. She didn't even look up. Who did you see? I described the events in the figure in a white and black plaid shirt. She said, oh, that's Ariel. She lived here before us and died here in the dining room. She really liked wine. That's why we sleep with the door closed. Just close it tonight and she'll probably leave you alone. She said that there was another one, a girl in a white nightgown that they only very occasionally see near a locked door that leads to an old attic. She also said that their downstairs neighbor had a distinctly bad spirit that lurked near the door outside. When Casper got home later, Bailey just said, Guess who I met last night? And he just laughed and said, Oh, you met Ariel? She's a little scamp. He told a story about being alone and watching a glass of Cabernet, Ariel's favorite, slide across the counter from across the kitchen. He said it was like a movie and couldn't really believe it until he had to run over and grab the glass before it was knocked off the counter. I closed the door for the rest of the week and didn't have any other encounters. Like I said, I have many stories about other experiences. But this was the first time I had actual physical contact. During the summer of 2008, I stayed with an aunt and uncle for a few months because I wasn't getting along with my parents. Another story for another day. While staying there, I worked overnights at a local convenience store. During the day, I was mostly alone while my aunt and uncle worked. At this point in my life, I had not experienced anything paranormal and did not believe in ghosts or spirits or the afterlife. I was 19 and knew everything. However, as soon as I moved in, I was faced with experiences that changed my perspective forever. The first one, I was alone. It was about 9 a.m., and I had just finished my shift, and I was preparing to wind down and get ready for bed. I was alone as usual. Both my aunt and uncle were working, so I had the house to myself. I was sitting in the downstairs living room eating. Out of seemingly nowhere, I heard what sounded like an adult running through the kitchen, which paralleled the living room and was completely out of view to me. A bang, and the footsteps went into the den that connected to the kitchen. I bolted up and went to the kitchen to investigate the sound. There was a coffee pot on the floor. That must have been the bang I heard when it hit the floor. I headed towards the den to see who was in there. However, it was empty. There was no way for anyone to have been in the den and me not see them. I shrugged it off and figured I was tired and went to bed. 
A few weeks later, my alarm woke me up at 9 p.m. for work. I groggily got up and headed towards the bathroom that was directly across my room. However, the door was shut. I could see the light shining from under the door, and I heard the distinct sound of someone sweeping the floor. Swish, swish, swish. It sounded like an old-fashioned straw broom. I found this very odd, considering no one besides myself used that bathroom, and I couldn't think of why anyone would be sweeping it at 9 p.m. at night. But I patiently waited some time for whoever was in there to finish up. After a few minutes, I couldn't wait any longer because I had to start getting ready for work. I approached the bathroom door. I could still hear the sweeping. And I gently knocked and asked if they were almost done. But to my surprise, the sound abruptly stopped. I opened up the door, and no one was there. I brushed this experience off as well and pushed it to the back of my mind. This last experience is the reason I ended up moving out. It was too terrifying to ignore what I knew what was happening in that house. My sister stopped by during the day to see me and her, and I were in the back room, hanging out and chatting. The door to the hallway was closed. My aunt and uncle were working, so her and I were the only two people who were home. As we gabbed away, we suddenly heard what sounded like 1920s music coming from downstairs. We froze and fell silent. The music grew louder and louder until it sounded like it was coming from every corner in the house. The music sounded like it was being played from a record player. My sister and I just stared at one another, too terrified to speak. Then we heard what sounded like a party erupting from downstairs. It sounded like thirty or more people were downstairs. Sounds of laughing, talking, and chinaware clinking filled the house. Then what we heard next terrified me. Loud, heavy footsteps started making their way upstairs where my sister and I were. Boom, boom, boom. It was slow but purposeful. The party sounds and music had reached a deafening level, but I could still hear those heavy footsteps above all the other sounds. Eventually, I heard the footsteps make it to the second floor. Then they slowly started stomping towards the closed door my sister and I sat behind. When the footsteps reached our door, I leapt up and yanked the door open. When I did, all the noise in the house stopped. The party, the music, the stomping. There was no one behind the door. The hallway was empty and the house was dead silent again. My sister and I wasted no time racing out of the house and staying outside until our aunt and uncle came home. They didn't believe our story and I moved out shortly afterwards and never stepped foot in that house again. I had moved to southeast Washington for work after college. The Blue Mountains were very close by, and being a hunter, I was very interested in learning the land for hunting season. I went on several solo scouting trips into various areas, always picking locations that would put me the farthest from any public road or access point. I find in hunting that most people are too lazy to get much off the roads, so less competition in the remote areas. Being outdoors has never been anything new to me. I grew up on a farm and ranch in Montana and have spent most of my youth working outside and dealing with animals. Not only would I have to tend to the various livestock, but I was raised into hunting and above all enjoy calling animals. I was ten when I fooled my first coyote that I was a dying jackrabbit and since then have mimicked everything from rodents to bull elk well enough to fool predators and big game routinely. I know with the explosion of bow hunting popularity that animal calls have become more commonplace, but I don't think you can appreciate it to the same extent a country boy can that learn how to echo back the calls of cattle, horses, chickens, etc., before old enough to attend school. I'm not bragging here. I'm just laying the groundwork that I have a very trained ear for animal calls. So I set out one afternoon to run up the blues to scout for game. I got a late start, but no real worries as most of the spotting of animal activity occurs at first and last light. I was able to only hike a couple miles from the road before I needed to find a spot to camp and watch for game. I climbed up a ridge and found a small, somewhat level spot to set camp. 
I had a pretty good view of the surrounding area, but ended up only seeing a couple of whitetails before dark. I kept a dry camp, no fire, and just turned in early for the night to get a good start in the morning. I was awoken at about 1 a.m. to probably the worst headache I have ever had. It would be just a surge of pain, then taper off, then come back. I was very careful about my hydration on the pack in, so I knew it wasn't dehydration, about my only real concern on the trip. So I'm lying in my bivy with this on again off, again pulse of pain trying my best to diagnose the cause, when my ears finally tuned to this strange sound coming from the mountainside above me. My thoughts moved from the headache to this animal call. It's not matching any of the calls I know. It's not matching any of the general patterns I know. It's too loud and repetitive. It's unique. It's very, very strange. I know instantly that this is a large mammalian call. You can say, how do I know that? And all I can say is I have a lifetime experience, like I stated above. It's definitely a mammal. It's big, with a deep, hollow vocal chamber and... Although this is evident, I tell myself it is likely some W.A. bird to ease my mind. After all, Washington must have different birds than Montana. So now I'm stuck that if I focus on the sound, I can't believe my bullshit that it is a bird, and as soon as I try to not think about the sound, the surging pain of my headache is unbearable. Close to 2 a.m., I make a judgment call and pull camp and head back to the truck with this call repeating the whole time before this decision. The way I hiked to my camp was pretty direct, but rough. However, there was a gated road just above my camp that circled back to the main road where my truck was parked. Distance would be longer to follow the road, but easier to travel in the night. Also, it led me directly towards this call before it would start to circle back to the truck. So with my 1911 in hand, I walked that road out. The interesting part is the sound stayed above me as I walked out, always directly up the mountainside and after climbing up to the road, only maybe 200. 300 yards distant, the animal clearly shadowed my departure, following along up the mountain, a ways. As soon as I dropped down out of the mountains, my headache completely cleared. I have since decided this was likely attributed to altitude sickness since I was also having a hard time regulating my breathing. The real fun came when I got home and had to start searching bird sounds for Washington. At this point, about 3-4 a.m., my search was not producing anything close to what I had heard. That small nagging voice finally had me Google Bigfoot call, and damn if I didn't find an audio file of what I had just heard almost instantly. That call was so unique that on my drive home, I grabbed a mouth read and was able to duplicate it quite quickly. There is no doubt in my mind about what I heard. Of course, I have doubt of any sound on the Internet labeled Bigfoot whoops, because who can say what call a mythological creature really makes, and how could you ever be sure? I can say that I never heard it again, even on return trips to that area. I even walked through the area it originated from, and it was a thick, nasty north slope face full of trees and vegetation. Let me start off with a few disclaimers. This isn't my story. It's a friend of my grandfather, and it's been a few years since I was told it, so the memory might be a bit hazy. It may not be scary to most people but I thought I would share it anyway. Also, if there are any mistakes in the story, I apologize. At the time of writing this, I was getting over a concussion. This story happened in upstate New York. My grandfather's friend was hunting with one other person. For privacy reasons, I won't use any names of the people in this story. Anyway, they came across a road and decided to split up, going in opposite directions on the road. He perched himself on a rock and waited till about four in the afternoon, but nothing showed. At this time, he decided to meet up with his friend. Right when he got off the rock he was sitting on, he saw something walking in the woods across a clearing not far from him. The thing walked out of the trees, and it had its right side facing him. He didn't know if it was a bear or a person, and he didn't know whether to talk to it or not. He then decided to whistle at it. 
The thing walked away from him on two legs back into the forest. It disappeared from his sight. It then walked back out of the forest, this time facing him. They stared at each other before the thing walked back into the woods again and out of sight. My grandfather's friend walked back down the road away from the thing he saw where he saw his friend walking up to him. He asked him if he had been down where he saw the creature. He said he never went down that way. To this day, he insists that it wasn't a bear because it would have stumbled on two legs, and he swears it wasn't a person because they would have alerted him to their presence. He insists that it was a Bigfoot. This is coming from a second-hand source, so you can judge on whether or not it's true, but I hope to find out what he saw. What I'm about to tell you is very true. I've never told anyone in my life till now. This happened to me back in 2003 at our family farm in Ohio. It was mid-October and my dad and I were on our way to the farm to deer hunt, as we always did every weekend. We arrived there around 5.45 in the morning. We sat in the truck talking and joking about who was going to see more deer or shoot the bigger buck like always. At about five minutes till six, we got out and got our gear on and headed towards the woods. As we entered the woods on the left side of the cow pasture, I noticed an odd eerie feeling, which was normal for me, I guess, as the woods always gave me that feeling, even since I was young. My dad walked me to my tree stand and made sure I got in and situated safely. He told me good luck, as always, and I said I'll be back at noon. He then proceeded to his stand. A few minutes after he left, this overwhelmingly tingle came over my body, as if someone or something was watching me. At this time, it was still dark. I began to look around the surrounding timber, trying to make out silhouettes, but couldn't. I was beginning to become very overwhelmed with that feeling of eyes upon me. A few minutes had passed since I scanned the timber last. I tried once more since my eyes had now adjusted to the dark better. I looked off to my left and then slowly towards my right again, and nothing. I tried to calm myself and mentally say it's nothing. You're fine. All of a sudden I heard crashing coming towards me from the left, and my heart sank as I looked. It was a few deer running for what appeared to be their life. They blew through the woods and didn't stop. I heard them still crashing through the timber. At this time I was only able to make out silhouettes and outlines of trees. I thought that it was odd, but maybe a coyote or something was after them, and I just shrugged it off. Maybe five minutes later it was still dark, but dawn approached. I then felt the hair on my neck stand up, and that eerie feeling came back upon me. My heart started to pound profusely. I heard the crunching of leaves and loud snaps of sticks from the direction the deer had run from, which was a neighbor's property on the left side of our woods. There were 100 plus acres of switchgrass and hundreds of acres of other woods. I looked up and saw what appeared to be my dad walking towards me. Daylight was starting to break now, but it was still pretty dark inside the woods. I waited for what I thought was my dad, and he got about 20 yards plus from me. I quietly said, What are you doing, Dad? No response. It just continued to walk towards me. So I said a little louder, Dad, what are you doing? Still no response. I began to say, hey, you know you're trespassing, buddy, but no response. As it got to the tree that my deer stand was in, I noticed that it was not my dad. I began to freak out. I looked across the woods to where my dad's tree stand was, and I saw his headlamp climbing up the tree. That's when I looked down and saw this thing standing directly underneath my tree stand looking dead at me. Whatever it was, it was tall enough to reach up and grab my foot with ease. Mind you, I'm 14 feet up this tree. I began to start crying from fear, and my heart was beating so hard and fast I thought it was going to explode out of my chest. I let out a wimpy, muffled air yell. It just grumbled at me and walked off, following the direction of the deer. I watched it disappear into the timber as the darkness was fading fast. Once it was gone, I was overwhelmed with this god-awful smell of body odor mixed with the smell of death, old hound dog, and trash. 
As the morning went on, the woods were dead silent. Not a bird, squirrel, or deer, nothing. I've never heard the woods that quiet before, ever. Once I calmed down enough, to climb down and out of my tree, I ran to my dad and told him I wanted to leave because I didn't feel well. So we left. This happened to me when I was 15. I'm now 29, and I've never hunted our woods in the morning again. I will not be there after dark to this day, and I still have not told anyone until now. I do not smoke, drink, or do drugs. Never have. I promise this is a 100% true story and the scariest thing that's ever happened. I was staying in a cabin on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland in the mountains. One day we were snowed in, and when you're snowed in in there, you're stuck, basically. Now, there are plenty of bears and deer up there. We kept salt licks, corn, and all kinds of stuff around, not to hunt, but just to feed them. Well, I walked by the back window, which is over the underground garage where we kept the snowmobiles and four-wheelers. I see this big brownish thing in the woods, probably fifty feet from the cabin, just sitting in the snow. I was shocked because I had never really seen a bear there, but I heard the stories about them being around. So I ran to get my mom to show her. As we walked back to the window, the damn thing stood up. And I don't mean like a bear, I mean like a big tall man standing up. It then turned around and walked with a huge stride and basically took off into the woods. We stood there, shocked. What the hell was that? My uncle just says, Oh, that's a squatch. He's a celebrity around here. I don't know if he was just trying to make us feel better by diffusing the situation with a comedic remark, but after that, I never went to those woods alone again. There, that's my encounter. I am a 32-year-old female from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks, all that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Tumbleson Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park, and I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs and bears, and I can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into paleontology? Yes, I was a Dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had readers digest mysteries of the unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaurus in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing, but I believed in them as much as a forester believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It did seem to me, though, that it seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though it's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch, or sitting on it, should I say. It sounded like it. No one was home. No media was on, and yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of the furniture being dragged right under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though we just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike. But even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Hell, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I think it was a horse that had gotten loose. 
but when I'd go out to investigate, I wouldn't find the thing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I use my horse's breeds for their names rather than think of names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 and 19 in this particular encounter, and by this time we gave up on cows. I hate cows and just had horses and chickens. Someone knocked at the door, and it was at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep for two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbors said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working at the time, and that was nothing new. This lot of horses had three experts and escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after some time. When it was cloudy, you could literally have to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch black. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone to the fence again. It happened a lot, believe it or not. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads and paused for a moment to see if there was any other horse or horses that had replied. To the horse I had heard squeal. That would give me an idea of where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse the woods and lead them back. Even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky trip. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. The land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center on the outside edge of a large pasture was an old white barn that we turned into a run. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture just to keep her from escaping. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho horse. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth and her eyes were really showing. Was I alarmed? No, as I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny fenced and area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny, fenced, in area with a tiny door. Three of those horses were over sixteen hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough that he touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral, and the last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger running them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine, and I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses, a couple of different Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds and other thoroughbreds and mustangs, all different kinds. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life, I'll tell you. They consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, no matter what breed it is, especially not in a group. They were just silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed any help, but I told him no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares didn't like men. I told him I'd take them out one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead them out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. 
My gelding and my Welch mare had their chests pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit was only 35, but people go 60 all the time. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their strange behavior, so I led them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish at first, though picking at the hay I threw out, walking around relentlessly, sticking to the barn like glue and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalized it by thinking it's the Abby flipping out. That's unnerving them. Why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures. Out of habit, I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the Abbey was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it cast a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forgo looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of the pasture. Again, the pasture was unlit and full of springs. Sometime, though during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to be seen. The spot on the road, though, where I was at, was paved and pretty well lit. My neighbor was paranoid. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I'd like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eyes shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why, besides it being where my horse was going nuts. Tix told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture, and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white, so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on one of them. It was next to this thing. It was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen, standing there watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil, and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you asked your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind with a sinking stomach. I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eyes shine. I didn't see any, though, so I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching Frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off, glancing at me sideways a few times. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noise. I stood there a long time after, looking for the eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I don't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs on this uneven inclined ground. I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before, 
and he made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point and considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack with them. They'd be gone in the morning and my mom would be pissed. So I darted over and grabbed them and ran like a bat out of hell. I should have left the tack. I know you're not supposed to run, but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got to the barn, threw the tack down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch, black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning, and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves me that whatever it was was watching me for however long. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping my mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her? Or was it in the unlit barn I walked through to get to the road? Was it the reason a psycho mar swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find out how they got out. Did they panic and jump? I did check the fence line away from the woods, and I did look for other tracks from the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost in the morning, but I will say the Abbey mare was running for a good while, and the ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. To this day, I'm not quite sure what it was that I felt and experienced. I just hope that it never comes back around my horses ever again. I was hiking with friends up in this particular canyon almost 20 years ago, maybe more. It was night, and I'm sure we were not supposed to be there after dark. We were all just young and dumb kids. It was about an hour or two hike up to this waterfall, but it was dry this particular year. We only had flashlights and light sabers, like I said, young and dumb. Cell phones weren't a big thing then. We got to the base of the waterfall, and we noticed a memorial with shoes tied on. They were fairly small shoes. We got up closer, and there was a laminated note with a picture of a boy in his teens explaining he had fallen and died at that spot. It was from family and how he was dearly missed. It happened exactly one year on that same day. We immediately hiked back down with no rest, freaking the F out. No picture proof, but it happened. Was out hiking in a canyon at around 2.30 a.m. I could hear coyotes yipping a couple miles away, but wasn't too scared. A power transmission line runs at the bottom of the canyon, and it makes a crackle sound at night when the moisture is high. I noticed a power company service van working with a cherry picker up on the line, but didn't think it was weird, probably fixing a power issue. As I got closer, I noticed the workmen were wearing what looked like motorcycle helmets that completely covered their face. They had floodlights on, and I could see the van was white with no logo. I was about 200 yards away and thought it was strange, but kept walking. I glanced over again, and all three men stopped working. One had come down off the crane silently and gathered with the others together perfectly still, facing my direction. I completely froze. With those helmets on, I couldn't tell what they were looking at, but their bodies all faced me, and they weren't taking to each other. I could see their helmets were solid white and didn't have reflective shields or anything to look through. At that point, I panicked and bolted. I glanced over my shoulder, and one was following me, but not actually moving, just somehow moved closer and standing still. While running, I remember thinking I never actually saw any of them move. That freaked me out and left the trail and ran off-road straight to the nearest house. I didn't look back until I was a good half mile away. When I did look, the van was there, but the men were gone. I kept running and eventually made it home. I was a high school counselor, and years ago I had a conversation with a student that I still think about a lot. Wondering what you, you all make of it, he was a good kid, not a liar, troublemaker, or anything. He wasn't mentally ill. 
He came into my office one day very excited because he read a library book. Can't remember which one. That made him remember some experiences from childhood that he had forgotten until then. He remembered often being in the woods on his ranch in Mexico and communicating with little people, like fairies or elves, who lived among the flowers and plants. He proceeded to tell me that there were three angels standing behind me. He said the angels knew that I was worried about my adult son, and I shouldn't worry that he was going to be fine. I had been very worried about my son, but there's no way this student would have known. Sure, he could have been crazy or making it up, but the weirdest part is that the second I had a thought in my head, he'd say the angel said you thought such and such, and he was correct every time. The conversation went on for a long time, and I can't explain it. He graduated soon after it, and I've run into him a couple of times, but nothing else significant. Thoughts? I was at a Korean community grocery store in September 2015. I went to buy some items, and as I was approaching the counter to pay, I noticed this twitchy small woman, young in her mid-twenties, I'm guessing, but she looked like she was in the DTS in need of a fix. It's a shame, really. I thought she would have been pretty if all cleaned up. Well, I still thought she was pretty. She was asking for matches, but she had no money. I made my payment and asked for matches for the lady, and it was just then, at the corner of my eye, I saw a darker, then dark mass just behind her, but taller. I turned my head and looked directly at it. It was moving like iron filings that would shift as you moved a magnet, but not unlike an insect. Its eyes were bright like diamond white, in angular like a diamond, but on the side. Its head was also pointed, and the head and back were not unlike a planarian worm. The weird thing is I looked down, and I saw the lady's arms and legs were wrapped from behind and underneath her appendages, and the thing's body was pressed so close, like a piece of clothing or blanket. That's when it moved like an insert, would like a twitch when it moved, so did the lady. Then, as I look at its face, just above her head, like someone peering over someone, just not fully, it turned and looked directly at me. I have to tell you, I knew enough from experience that you do not show fear and remain calm when all you want to do is scream and point and run, which I really wanted to do. I acted like I was looking through it and looked around, not caring that I was just seen and almost ran. The clerk handed her the matches, and she thanked me, then I left. As I left, I was looking straight ahead, but internally I was concentrating behind me, wondering if it was still looking at me. All this time happened in under a minute. I began wondering what I had seen and drew it once I got home. I showed my siblings a few days later and told them what happened. They claimed it could be a possession or a den, I'm still not sure, but know this. I look at people now differently who are on drugs or under the influence. How they move or walk is exactly like how this creature moves. What if that is true and part of the reason why they can't stop? You know, if you watch zombie movies like Walking Dead, they kind of move like that too. It's just a weird way they walk and shuffle. I haven't seen anything like this before, nor since. Maybe you or your reader might know what the heck I saw. This occurred in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Best regards. Me and a friend were part of a caving club about seven, eight years ago. A group of people that likes to climb around deep caves and such. We were in a really deep cave in the Austrian Alps. Can't remember the name of it. It was unpronounceable. So we've been climbing ever deeper for hours on end, and we're currently making our way across the ledge of a chasm. Imagine a very deep hole with two entrances at the very top. We were laying our ropes from entrance to entrance. The entire thing was maybe 20, 25 meters across, so no easy thing to do. 
We were about hallway across with my friend ahead of me when suddenly there's the most creepy and subtly evil howl coming from below, from the complete darkness under us, accompanied by a blast of stale, warm air. Now you may have been afted, maybe even horrified, but nothing, and I say nothing in my life since that day has ever compared to the dread and sheer horror I felt while hanging on a thin wire over a hole that's God knows how deep while we have nothing but a small lantern as a light source. We just kind of hung there for a minute, not really sure what to do when my friend finally got his bearings and awakened me from that paralysis. We made our way across and were on our way to the deepest point, but I was still very, very shaken from that. I've researched and found that it was most likely just air that's been trapped down there for a few thousand years and that got released when we were overhead, and the sound was the caves being caves and all. But I wasn't able to get it out of my head for months after that, and I just kind of stopped caving after that. I actually have a story that happened in the late 70s. I was a teenager. What happened was I was coming home in a car with my boyfriend and it was late at night. We were coming home from a party and we were on a country road that was very, very deserted. All cattails and shrubs by a lake on the backside of a lake. There were a couple of farms out there but nothing on the stretch of road we were on. And there were a lot of bends in the road so we couldn't go too fast. We came around a sharp bend in the road, and standing right there was this huge creature, about eight feet tall, hairy. I did not know what a Bigfoot was then. I did not know what to make of it. I thought it was part human and part ape, and then I thought maybe it was somebody in a costume or something. I was so frightened. I remember my boyfriend saying, lock the doors. Lock the doors. We had these manual locks, and I was able to quickly lock my door, but I couldn't turn around. I was too scared to turn around and lock that back seat door. I was just frozen because of this creature. We were going around 45 miles per hour because you couldn't go too fast around these curves. This creature was right next to my window, running at that speed, keeping up with the car, trying to open the door. He couldn't open the door. Finally, that road straightened out. We were able to accelerate and were able to lose him then. When we accelerated, we just tore out of there. We were both so frightened. It was like a nightmare, something I'll never forget. When we got home, I was sharing that story with my family, and my sister was like, It's a Bigfoot. It's a Bigfoot. I'd never even thought of a Bigfoot. I just thought, What is this thing? It just came out of the woods and started racing after the car. The witness was later asked if she saw the creature's face. She stated, I was too afraid when we first approached and came in contact with the creature. When the car slowed down on the curb right next to it, when it was standing there, it was eye to eye. After that, it was just a race to get out of there, and I was too scared. I couldn't even lock that back door. He was right next to the car, running a couple of feet from the car, trying to get to the door handle, and my boyfriend said, We ought to get out to here. This is horrible. You never think you're going to see something like that in this area at night. I live on Long Island. The beach I go to has a jetty of just huge boulders. When I was about ten and my younger sister was eight, we found an opening towards the front that was just big enough to submit the passage of a small body. We crawled through, the water up to our knees. Looking back, this was an incredibly stupid thing to do. The tide could have come in at any moment, and we were underneath giant rocks. However, I digress. The jetty wasn't wide, maybe about twelve feet from one side to the other after we had been crawling for about seven feet. We came to a bit of a sandy hill. It was absolutely covered in dead animals. Mice, rats, birds, you name it. They were skinned. Who put them there? They weren't animals you'd typically find at the beach. And were they replenishing them? High tide would certainly reach that place, sweeping them all away. 
We pretty much rapid speed army crawled our way back out, didn't attempt to explore again. My daughter and I were hiking behind Shaver Lake, California, in Fresno County. We kept hearing strange whooping sounds that were all around us, sometimes far away. Others are very near. We also could smell something bad from time to time. We came up on a pretty meadow where the odor was exceptionally bad. We took a shortcut through an area that had just been cut. The ground was bare earth. I was keeping my eye on the ground because I like to watch for animal tracks. It's a habit of mine. I saw a huge footprint. I even have a picture of it somewhere, with a smashed spider in the print that it stepped on. I noticed there were more. I actually followed them up the side of a hill, thinking it had to be bear print. But each and every print was shaped like a human foot, not a paw. At one point, the prints were sideways as if looking back down the hill. My daughter pointed out that whatever it is, I'm following it and might be up at the top watching me. So I ran back down to where my daughter was waiting. There was a stand of trees right on the edge of the meadow where we followed the odor. In the middle of the close circle of trees was a huge mound of scat. Now I'm not talking about bears or mountain lions. I know what they look like. This was piled at least one foot high and had the look of a very huge human feces, but smelled horrible. This spooked us because we were thinking whatever made that is huge and could still be close by because it looked fresh. All the way back off that trail, we were followed by that whooping sound. I'm getting goosebumps just telling this. So that's it. Now we are too scared to go hiking back there without any men with us. I absolutely believe there is a Bigfoot. We lived on my grandfather's property in the early 1970s. He had about 75 acres in southern Ontario, Canada, near French River Provincial Park. On the property was a swamp. We hunted bullfrogs in the summer. There was also a beaver meadow that gave us an eerie feeling, as if we shouldn't be there. Many times there were no sounds in that area, almost a dead zone. Occasionally we heard a knocking wood sound, but at the time it was not a thing that we knew about Bigfoot. We didn't know creatures would do that. My grandfather had an old sap shanty along the meadow that was in disrepair and it had started to shift and fall over. The weird feelings that we got when we were there were creepy. One night, five of my friends and I were taunting each other to ride our minibikes back to the beaver meadow in the dark. I was lucky enough not to need an excuse to participate as my headlight wasn't working. Then we noticed a small but bright light coming from the beaver meadow, and it hovered about 40 feet off the ground. It didn't move until all of us were looking at it. It suddenly veered to the left, fast enough to leave a light streak, like a sparkler when you swing it around. Then it stopped. Then it would start again for a few seconds. Then it would stop. This continued for about 10 minutes until it started to expand and change its shape. It was not saucer shaped nor egg-shaped. It was more oblong. No lights were flashing, and the whole craft gave off a bright white light. As we watched, it seemed to grow ever so slightly, so slow that it took a few seconds for us to realize it was moving towards us. The area it had come up out of was about a quarter mile away from us. There was nothing in the field to impede our view. It was a cool night, and no insects were making a sound. At about 50 or so meters from us, we saw it clearly. It was bright white with no windows or external markings. The closer it came, the clearer we could see what looked like a single object emitting a light that seemed to create a circle directly under it. It never sped up or slowed down until it hovered directly over our small group. It stopped without any sound and stayed in place for what seemed to have been a minute or two. We could see it was around 10 meters above us. It didn't spin or hum. It just hovered. We didn't feel any movement of air, no heat or any other sensation. But we were in awe at what we were witnessing. Then suddenly it took off straight up and blended into a pinpoint of light. 
among the sea of stars above us. We stood around for about an hour or so, trying to figure out what we had just seen. Just before we were ready to leave for the night, we started to hear the wood knocking coming from the woods along the beaver meadow. Frankly, it scared us. We quickly got on our motorbikes and hauled our butts out of there. The next summer, three of us were near the beaver meadow one early evening. As the light started to fade, we again observed a very bright white object hovering near the woods. Suddenly, we heard four distinct and loud wood knocks that were followed by a deep, growling roar. We were frozen in shock. We looked in the direction of the woods and saw several lighted objects rising out of the woods, ascending above the trees and quickly moving up into the darkening sky. Then we heard four more wood knocks and crashing sounds in the woods. We quickly got out of the area. That was the last time that I ever visited the Beaver Meadow. My grandfather sold the property not long after that and moved to Guelph, Ontario. I never found out why he sold the property, but I do know that he did so quickly. A male employee, approximately 62 years old, working at a water treatment facility on the east side of Cincinnati, was conducting his nightly rounds. He needed to drive to a specific tank and open a valve. As he drove down a rural road dotted with houses, he noticed something standing in front of a garage on his right, illuminated by bright overhead light. He put his truck in reverse and backed up to get a better look, eventually stopping at the foot of the driveway. The creature he saw was standing roughly where an SUV was parked on the right side. The image on the right reveals a light pole directly across from a basketball hoop. I was told that there was another light brightly illuminating the area near the garage door, but I couldn't see it from my vantage point. The driveway was approximately 50 feet long. These images were captured from inside a car just as the witness would have seen them. For the privacy of the residents who were not interviewed, I blurred out the house and license plate numbers. It makes me wonder if they have any idea about what lurks around their house at night. The witness described a bizarre creature that he estimated to be about the size of a man. It had brown, leathery skin, but had regular animal hair on the head, neck, and chest. He mentioned a canine head with a long muzzle and pointed ears on top. According to him, the legs were dog-like, but the arms appeared man-like. Interestingly, the creature stood in an unusual pose similar to a yoga position called intense side stretch. The witness said that instead of forming a V-shape, the creature's legs formed more of a horseshoe shape, which made sense if they were canine-type legs. The creature's arms hung down in front, but the witness wasn't sure if they were touching the ground or its own foot. Strangely, the creature didn't move but kept one eye on the witness, maintaining a profile view. The witness reported a sort of sneer on the creature's face, as if it were saying, You see me, don't you? He said the overall feeling about this creature was that it was bad news. The witness and the creature stared at each other for about a minute, with the creature remaining in place, just looking at him. Eventually, the witness continued on his duty up the road. When he returned about eight minutes later, the creature had vanished. I was taken to the water tank, which employees must attend every morning at 4 a.m. As the crow flies, this tank is only about a hundred yards from where the sighting occurred. This is where the witness was heading at the time of the sighting. The employee goes there alone each morning at 4 a.m., drives up to the locked gate, opens it, then walks into the enclosure to open a valve on this tank. On the right side of the driveway is a dense hedge of trees and honeysuckle. On the other side of that hedge is a small field with an outbuilding and parking lot, followed by the road, and on the opposite side, the house where the sighting took place. To the right of the tower is mostly farmland. One can feel quite isolated in the dark at this tank. My friend pointed out that going into the gate to the tank isn't bad, but on the way back, your headlights are in your face, making it hard to see. For some time before the sighting, the witness had expressed his uneasiness about coming to this particular location. He always felt like something was watching him. 
It's worth noting that this witness is far from a coward and is actually known for being a bit of a badass. However, he had long felt uncomfortable about coming here in the dark. The locations of this tank, the water treatment facility in the sighting, are very close to a state park. A wildlife area, a lake, a large creek, and railroad tracks. Unfortunately, I haven't yet obtained permission from the witness for a direct interview, but I'm still holding out hope. This information comes from my friend who works with the witness. I encountered a reptilian hybrid several years ago while attending college in Oregon. This individual was extremely manipulative with words and dangerous with its deeds. Once I told him that he was a cold-blooded bastard after he humiliated a friend, he became very angry, staring at me with a hideous glare. He said I would suffer for my disrespect. That night, while studying in my dorm room, I was alarmed by a shadowy figure starting to manifest. I am sensitive to energy, so I immediately started to raise the vibration in the room. It quickly dissipated. That startled me, so I was on full alert. Later that night, at approximately 2 a.m., I awoke from what I thought was a dream, but alarmed by a grotesque reptilian form on top of my body attempting to choke me. It screeched and wailed like it was taking great delight in my fear and pain. I struggled and finally threw the fiend off me. As it cowered on the floor, glaring at me, I immediately knew it was the individual I had insulted earlier. It thrust itself at me. I reached for my pants on my desk chair to retrieve my pocket knife. It was choking me as I pulled the weapon from my pants pocket and toiled to open the blade. I was able to push it off, long enough to slash it across its left arm and upper chest. With a howl of rage, it ran to the wall and disappeared through it. I turned the light on to fully illuminate the room and noticed blood on the knife, bed sheets, and floor. I checked myself to make sure it wasn't my blood. I was awake the rest of the night and ready to strike if I needed to defend myself. I was exhausted in the morning but made my way to class. I noticed the individual coming out of his dorm room. He had a bandage on his left arm in the same spot where I had cut the reptilian. He noticed me and walked directly to me, nose to nose. He glared at me with those evil reptilian eyes. Watch your back, because this isn't over, he murmured. I walked past him and made my way to class. Later that day, the dorm staff and housing administrators wanted to talk to me. While I talked to one of the dorm staff regarding this individual, the administrator blurted out, Don't provoke him. It's important that you not cause trouble for him. The dorm staff was obviously terrified of this guy and behaved like his minions. This was startling. That same night I felt wary of a presence watching me. That sense of dread continued for several weeks until I moved off campus to avoid this hostile individual. However, I often noticed him and his acquaintances blatantly watching me when I was on campus and in town. I know that I wasn't the only person affected by this guy, but no one ever dared to discuss it. Many strange things happened as well, including the sudden death of two students in that same dorm. No details of those deaths were ever disclosed, just that they died because of medical reasons. I know others are out there who are aware of the reptilians and that there are ways that humanity can use to defend itself against them. I have been fortunate to meet several people who safeguarded themselves and family. These terrible beings are a scourge that we will continue to confront. Be safe, Mason. My name is Tommy, and I've always been drawn to the mysterious and the unexplained. One summer, when I was just 14, my life took a turn I could never have anticipated. It all began with a camping trip to Browning's campground, a serene retreat in the heart of Versailles, Indiana. My family and friends had joined me for what should have been an ordinary adventure, but little did I know that our lives would be forever changed by the enigmatic creatures we would encounter that night. The campfire crackled, casting its warm, flickering light across our faces as we sat huddled around it. 
It was a typical evening, with laughter and stories filling the air. But as the night wore on, I couldn't help but feel an unsettling sense of unease. It was as though something in the woods was watching us, waiting to reveal itself. My gaze wandered toward the forest edge, and what I saw sent shivers down my spine. Two creatures, unlike anything I had ever seen, stood there in the shadows, their fiery red eyes glowing with an eerie intensity, locked onto our group. They were colossal, with the body of a man but the head of a wolf, and their fur was as black as the night itself. I was the first to notice them, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I stammered, trying to alert my companions, who turned to see the unearthly beings before them. We watched in terrified awe as the creatures slowly retreated into the darkness, vanishing like specters. The memory of their red eyes would haunt my dreams for years to come. Over the next decade, the mystery of Browning's campground continued to unravel. Two of my cousins, not much older than I was when I first encountered the dogmen, had their own chilling experience. They described seeing a creature similar to what I had witnessed, but with a different shade of fur, a menacing gray. The years passed, and more accounts of these elusive beings began to surface. Last summer, during a lively campground party, a group of revelers claimed to have seen one of these creatures lurking near their campsite. It was tall, dark, and just as menacing as the ones my cousins and I had witnessed. The red eyes, a common thread in these accounts, seemed to hold an ancient and eerie wisdom that defied explanation. As the reports continued to pile up, our small town couldn't ignore the mounting evidence and the accounts of its residents. The term dogman began to circulate, a moniker for these enigmatic beings that had become an intrinsic part of the folklore of Versailles, Indiana. For my family, Browning's campground had been a cherished summer tradition, but it had also become a place of mystery and unease. Every visit held the potential for another encounter with the dogman, and while some might dismiss our stories as mere campfire tales, those fiery red eyes were etched into our memories, a reminder that there are mysteries in this world that defy explanation and continue to haunt us to this day. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.